Hey, what's up, First Smoke fam? We get into a three hour long special with John Capetta from High Times about the current state of the market and everything happening in between. If you haven't already, please go sign up to our Patreon and support. Join the First Smoke family. It's patreon.com slash FSOTD. Hit the like button, subscribe, and get in the comments. Let us know what you think of the episode. And if you got no opinion on that, let us know what you smoking on. You know what I'm saying? Turn on the post notifications and make sure you support the show. We're relying on you. It doesn't happen without you guys. Without further ado, let's get into what John has to say. Peace. Hey, what's up, everybody? We're back. It's first smoke of the day. It's your boy Pack in the building. I'm here with my co-host Blackleaf. What up, yo? You already know. And today, man, we got some high times coming together. My man, Mr. John Capetta, is in the building. What's good, homie? Uh, very excited to be here. Thank you guys for having me. I love what you guys have been doing. So I feel uh, I'm beside myself to be sitting in the seat right now. Man, we've been we met formally on 420. Yes, Washington sir. Washington Park. We were talking about that earlier, and ever since then, it's just been. We see you everywhere. Like, you know, there's a, like a, the group and I call the group is like the group that's like seldom seen meeting together. We're apart, but we're like together, you know, and like you're definitely a part of that group. And it's so dope that. to see like you're not just peeking your head in super out of touch. Like you're really in this shit and you're really doing it. So it's a pavement game, right? You got to you got to walk the miles if you want to actually, you know, know the game. And uh I think that's honestly, that's what's cool about you guys is like the thing that like first turned me on is like, you're talking to all the right people. You know what I mean? And like, on, again, that's why I feel weird even being here is because I don't see myself like that. But um, the, like everyone that you've brought on, it was like, and I said this to you before we got on the show, when High Times has talked about like, hey, should we do podcasts or whatever, like interviewing weed guys? I've kind of been like, nah, the first smoke guys have that lane. You know what I mean? Like if we're going to be doing a podcast, doing we need to be serving another purpose because that consumer is already being satisfied, you know? And Damn. uh appreciate that, man. Yeah, yeah of course. Real. Major ups. I mean, I, listen, like High Times, High Times has been around for almost 50 years, right? And Legacy I think brand. exactly. And so I'm I'm very much aware that I'm carrying a torch here. But I think the thing that united all of us about High Times back in the day was the fact that like it was the voice for this plant. So it was a way for us to learn about this thing that we cared about without having to like necessarily dig through everything or smoke all the shitty weed to find out about the good weed, you know? And uh, I'm not ignorant to the fact that like, it's a brand that's gone through many different, you know, iterations and stuff like that. And not everyone loves the directions that it's gone, but uh, it's very important to me that it's reflective of everything that's happening, right? So even those people who aren't a super big fan of ours, like I want the magazine to be something that also speaks their language, right? So the only way I know to actually, you know, know all that stuff is to be out there. And like, and I, I appreciate you saying that, that like I'm, I'm out a lot because I do, <laughs> it does take yeah, a toll. Yeah, in the mix. Um, but like a big part of that is also finding the right people who are out there and who are writing and who are saying the right things. Like, in fact, that's really, High Times has always been like freelancer based where we're always trying to bring in different voices from all around the market. But Weirdo specifically um, has been about trying to kind of bridge the gap to people that have write at other publications and kind of represent different voices to still kind of be under this umbrella because again, it's, it should be for all of us. And I think that like the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, social media has kind of like figured out more ways to divide us than it has bring us together. And yeah, it's the, it's the irony, right? Of it's social crazy. media has caused everyone to be non-social. It's, it's crazy, but I yeah. think that like the reason why like vlogs and podcasts, like the things that you guys are doing um, are taking off is because a lot of these consumers who don't necessarily feel like they have voices are looking for people who can not only share their opinion, but show them more. They're looking for curators. You know what I mean? There's so much noise in today's world. And like, I probably picked that up at my last job, but like, I've kind of always instinctually seen high times as like this, like really valuable curator for the culture. And, uh, you know, the fact that I get to be the guy who's helping curate that is like, I pinch myself every morning, you know? So 
when it like on that social media point too, like, you know, if you were to think like what the community from social media standpoint, you're like, oh, everyone's fighting, everyone hates each other. And then you go to an event or you're around like what he's saying for 420, and you realize like, no, everyone has a lot of passion and love for each other. It's very few animosity. It's it's that it looks like it on social media, but it's not that in person. It's all love most of the time. I think, and actually you guys remember Clubhouse, right? I think the mm-hmm. reason why Clubhouse picked up so much that did, and that's why like Twitter took on spaces or whatever is because you lose a lot in text, right? Like it's hard to hear inflection. So especially in a short, like, you know, 140 characters or just a quick comment response to something like there's a lot left up to the imagination, right? And so actually it's kind of the reason why I write the way I do when I do my pieces is trying to keep it conversational so that you can kind of <clears throat> feel the flow from reading it as opposed to just having to infer that. I think that's like what a lot of great writing does is kind of like paint the most of the picture for you with you still able to like color it in in your head, you know? Um, <clears throat> so being able to like figure out those stories is you got to get through a lot of bullshit to find the gems. Right. And like, I think a, the job has made me way more patient because like, you know, uh, you definitely have to hear a lot of crazy nonsense to, you know, get to the stories that are worthwhile, but like some of the stories and like, as you guys have uncovered are so otherworldly and inspiring that like the world needs to hear it, you know? They're definitely unique and compelling, you know, like those books right there, right? Like that's real history, real smugglers, like real people that like shape shift in a market, you know, they created what is now to be soon to be legalized, you know what I mean? And it's just, it's, it's been a lot longer than it seems to have. And it, it's the, the variations and all the different changes have just been crazy. It's like, the amount of people who don't realize like, so, and actually I, I'm already stoned, so I'm, you know, You're rambling good. all over the place. And High Times has been there to cover most of it. But the thing that I, I've noticed since I've been internal at High Times is the differences of each platform, right? Like Twitter, and I've known this, but like you can see it much more vibrantly. Like when you have your behind the scenes and looking at all the analytics, like our Instagram is really a bud porn audience. Mm-hmm. If we try and push anything else on them, they're not happy. But like the platforms hate that shit. You know what I mean? So it's like, we got to walk this line of like trying to cater to showing them what they want to see while also not getting our page de- deleted. And then like Facebook is like, and, and fuck an antique at this point. I don't, that's not even worth going into. Um, but then you have like TikTok, which is like basically impossible for cannabis brands to actually participate on. So we're not even trying to play that game right now. And then Twitter, which is like a news platform. So like for us, Twitter is like still a great way for us to really communicate things with people. But even that, you got to like goat people into like learning now or reading a story and like, you know, actually paying attention. So like, again, that you got to get through so much bullshit that like, in order to find some degree of diamond that like, you're going to lose a lot of your audience if you're not properly conveying it and or in in the in the medium that they need in that specific place you know what i mean it's still print king so i would say the dot com stuff is his king okay. i mean now realistically there's more money coming from the dot com because we can get like millions of eyeballs right whereas there's not that many eyeballs on the print magazine anymore but to me the print magazine is still the most important element of our brand right like it's very undervalued to have anything physical anymore. You know what I mean? I think like we're seeing it with like designer toys, right? Like we were talking about it before, like the idea of bringing things like, like sculpture used to be a huge part of art. You know what I mean? And then like talking Terps, talking Terps is like as a good modern example, but like people literally used to chisel rock right now. People are like making molds and making things out of plastic or whatever. But the idea of bringing like an idea into the physical world is like, it's a concept that we've largely lost in our digital existence, right? So to me, the magazine is still the most important thing because like, if, I, if, if you get a magazine with your face on it, with your image, with your story, like that's a lot more permanent 
than if you just see it on the dot com, right? So now advertisers, which our business runs off of, right? Like advertisers still want the eyeballs. They want the the, the uh, addressable advertising where people can just click through to buy something and convert or whatever. But that's also because like our industry is not really the most sophisticated advertisers. You know what I mean? Like they don't really understand that you need to make several impressions on a consumer before that consumer will make a purchasing decision for you, right? Um, a lot of things, especially like since social, back to social, um, since influencers came out, um, the game has turned into like, oh, I can just give my product to this one person, they'll make some content for me, and then they'll get it seen by a ton of people. But like really the traditional model is you pay somebody to make an ad for you and like that costs you a bunch of money. Then you gotta pay a bunch more money to get people to actually see it and care and pay attention. And you got to do it a bunch of times so that like eventually they want to buy your product, right? Cannabis, ca cannabis advertisers are largely people who are in, have been involved in the game, who are used to selling in ways of, hey, smell this bag. You know what I mean? Not communicating through like imagery and, you know, sound and like. That's a lot. It's a, it's a lot different, like the part of the reason why. Again, with the magazine, like I think it's so special is like written word is still very beautiful to me. I understand that like a lot of the world has moved past it and really wants video. But I think if you can say something simply in words that like that's still some of the finest art, right? So for us, like the magazine is our vehicle to really not only provide you this experience, but like tell stories that matter and on a permanent record. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like everything that we publish there, like we publish everything on high times, but I could pull a story from hightimes.com and ever anytime. You know what I mean? Like I can't make a page disappear from a magazine. That's always going to be part of our, yeah, know, that's a really good point. Archive. That's a really good point. It's a, it's also crazy because like the digital experience is not designed for just reading, right? Like that's the reason why all the platforms cater to video, they cater to things like podcasting, right? Like that's more passive e experience. Whereas reading, you actually have to be an active participant in. So like, again, it's not going to resonate with everybody. Part of the reason why we started weirdos is because there, and I I, it was created with the idea that it would eventually live in print and like we'd take the best ones and put it in the magazine. But Part of the reason why we did it in this digital format is we can be a little bit more flexible to what's happening right now. You know what I mean? Like if I put the THC percentages bullshit piece in the magazine, mm -hmm. like that becomes a thing where like people who don't know, like the layman is just like, oh, does this guy not know what he's talking about? Or is this like a bullshit metric? You know what I mean? Like a lot, like they get lost with the headline. Whereas like online where I can have a conversation about it, where people could yell at me in the comments and I'll actually respond and go back and forth with them, it becomes more of an experience. So the magazine we've been trying to do is like apply digital metrics to that, right? Like what can make you like time on site is a big thing for apps, right? So what makes you actually stay with the magazine longer? What will, what will keep you there as opposed to just glancing through and reading, looking at the pictures, right? What will make you return to the magazine? And like, you know, coming back to the app as opposed to just being there one time. Again, same digital metrics on the magazine. So we've created things like entertainment pages and stuff like that, where like some are just coloring book things. You know what I mean? Some are like, um, uh, like puzzles and things like that. Like, obviously we know everyone's stoners. We're not, you know, doing a New York times crossword or anything like that, but you know what I mean? Like little activity things that like, Oh, you're, you know, waiting for outside in, the, in your car for something. You know what I mean? Maybe you take the magazine with you and it helps you kill 15 minutes, get you off your phone, you know, maybe save your eyes from a headache or something like that, you know? Um, so again, the cool thing about high times is we have to, or I'm utilizing an old school toolkit to try and solve new school problems very much counter to what a lot of the world is doing right now like as i'm sure you guys saw like the pivot to video was crazy but so we're also trying to play the game where we're providing value but also using the new school trick so earlier we mentioned ooh, uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, gq um list yeah it's like the 10 things you can't leave your house without so the cop list came from being so just for background a cop list is like 10 picks i make every month of hype products or cool new things that are coming to market that consumers sh should actually try um 
there were two reasons why I did that. One was because like listicles and stuff like that are blowing up everywhere and everybody wants that format, right? Because it's easier to, to, to just glaze over as opposed to having to read all the things. You can only read the paragraphs you want to read easier, you know? Um, but also because like I'm getting so many products, I'm trying so many things, I'm posting so much shit on Instagram and people started hitting me up and being like, oh, I tried this thing that you posted on your Instagram. It wasn't that good. And like, I was like, well, I posted on my Instagram because someone sent it to me for free, not because I was like, you know, saying this is an amazing product. The cop list is my way of saying, hey, these are the products that like I actually think deserve attention. But again, there's a bunch of different ways we could have done that. It could have been a video format or whatever, but like a listicle was like, okay, I need to figure out some way to, you know, play that game too. So let's just slap these two together and see where it goes. And I mentioned this before we went live, but like that shit has grown way beyond <laughs> what I expected it to. I was just like, really was doing it as a vehicle for people to like really know, hey, this is, you know, these products are actually worth your money because I try and keep in mind that like, I, can't, I couldn't smoke the way I do if I wasn't given as much product as I am, right? Like I'm, I don't, I come from humble means. And like, I remember being the kid who like was scraping together 25 bucks to, you know, try and get the cheapest eighth that I could, you know what I mean? So I try and keep in mind for anybody that I'm smoking. And like, again, another thing that we said off air, like the guys that are super expensive for like the super small batch stuff, like to me that the you pinnacle, think it's worth it? I think that you have to, I don't think I have not seen any weed that has been that over the top that it justifies that Agreed. price point. I think that over a thousand dollars an ounce for people that are at wondering what the price I point is. I would say even eight hundred dollars an ounce. There you go. Like okay. I think like like yeah. six hundred dollars an ounce is too expensive for me. And also like I will say five to six was top shelf like crazy out of the world back in the day when I came. Five. Up. I think five yeah. to me is like the is that ceiling right? Yes. This is the this is the mountaintop of weed should be five hundred dollars an ounce, which to me is still more expensive than I think is like really fair but like okay you know small batch whatever whatever what's like fair for fire zip price i mean because you know like in high times like it was always like oh the, the ounce price like oh it's we it's love that it's 300 ounces <laughs> yeah. here you know like that was a big part of like the build-up because it was that disconnection and that now, was granted of, these are like myspace days that was before like, in the 70s they for were for us you know what i mean just yeah, like yeah. but just like discussing it and shit and being like oh you know this that and like it's so true. I creating the market, like I'm getting more than that. Hell you yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the market index was the first way for NorCal to, or like California to know what prices were going for on the East Coast. You know what I mean? Consistently, a way for like, okay, like you're sending packs out there. Like this is what people are commanding. So like, maybe it's time to raise your prices. You know what I mean? And like, again, not. I don't want to say that we contributed. That. What do you mean? How did they go about that? They just let people we submit have, what they were oh, paying. Oh yeah, we get people submit. We get people submitting still all the time. We actually, so we did try and modernize it a little bit. It looks a little bit more. Man, that's I would say stock markety now. And like again, we can mm. pull data from like you know a lot of these platforms that. And I will say, maybe I shouldn't say this because it's needlessly talking shit. But I don't think that like I come from working with data and at like at, at a large scale. And uh, I don't think that any of the guys that are trying to quantify the market really have a full picture right now. That said, it is easy to find out like what's truly selling, you know, their lowest tier fucking A4 and their highest tier A4 and do that math. You know what I mean? So that's where a lot of it comes from. But um, again, like that, the idea of like connectivity is like, I think is important but also a lot gets lost in translation because like the weed that they're selling for like whatever the price is in Tennessee is not going to be the same weed that it is in California. You know what I mean? So like also figuring out how to like grade that in a, in a way that is repeatable and not relying on something as stupid as THC percentage is, <laughs> is difficult at scale because like realistically we got a lot of people who we trust people. Who, there are plenty of people who've been submitting these numbers every month for like, decades you know what i mean so like there are a lot of like og heads and like we get pictures every day i get dozens of pictures of people's grows and stuff like that and like just people who want to be like a picks of the crop and stuff mm -hmm. so like there is and i don't want to sound uh like offensive to any of the old heads who like have been with us for a while because there's plenty we have a diehard community that's been rocking with us for a very long time um but figuring out how we kind of make that party more approachable and more expansive to all of the newcomers and all of the people who like, maybe this is a better way of saying it. I think 
this, all the heads <clears throat> thought that legalization was going to make the cannabis industry look a lot more like us. And that was never what was actually happening, right? The, the legalization play was making room and making the game comfortable to everyone who didn't want to step into the mucky, you know, outlaw shit that we were doing before this, right? Like it's about making the cheerleaders and the soccer moms feel comfortable, not the trappers, right? So like we have this identity crisis as a community of like, none of us got into the business to wear taxes or be compliant. You know what I mean? But if we want to survive this next chapter, you got to play the game to some degree to win, right? And so how do we do that in a way that's fashionable? How do we do that in a way that like makes people, it inspires people, makes them want to compete? And I think one of the special things because of the foundation of high times that I was able to institute like right when I came in is we're not going to write any negative stories anymore. Um, I know that that pisses off a lot of heads, right? But we're a wholly broken industry, right? There's so many hurdles and so many just handcuffs on everybody trying to play the game that I would rather focus the limited breath that we have on uplifting and inspiring those guys that are trying to do it as opposed to tearing down somebody who's trying to play this game that's the odds are stacked against them, you know? And as we talked about before, um, like I don't ever really tell somebody they have bad weed. You know what I mean? I'm never going to, I don't ever want to dissuade somebody from following something they're passionate about because that's happened to me before. Like I've been on the other side of like, oh, hey, check this out. This is something that I'm really, you know, proud of. And then just like getting it shit on and then being done with it and not ever wanting to look at it again because I'm so embarrassed about it. You know what I mean? So like I never want anybody to feel that, but I'm also not ignorant to the fact that this is a bucket list thing for a lot of people, right? A lot of people who grew up reading high times, like being winning a cup, being in high times is like, you know, it's a, a lifetime goal, right? So being able to like dole that out is like really special, you know, because like, again, I don't, again, I don't like to call myself a gatekeeper because I think that's like a, it's a negative connotation to it. I like to open doors for people that I believe deserve it, right? And so like, there's a ton of bad players in the game. And like, also I'm not gonna pretend like I, I can sniff them all out, right? Because like plenty of people seem great for the first couple of years and then they turn into like dickheads, you know, after you've already made a deal with them, right? Um, but if I could focus on helping tell the stories and helping put more good into the world. I think especially at a time where we're so divided from social and everyone is like on edge because of things like COVID and what's happening in the fucking the government and shit like that, that like to some degree, that's a community service, you know? I agree, man. Positivity too. And like, it's easy to say like, oh, well then it's not that you're skewing everything to the positive. You're just only uplifting things. It's like, why well, talk about a bunch of negative stuff, which does, it gets the clicks though. That's the hard part. It is a difficult thing to, to manage because when we started this project, we were big on, you know, we're not here to sell negativity. We're not here to come shit on people. We're not here to like just sell people out. Like but it's we're really here are. to like tell stories, uplift brands and showcase some people that we met along our path happened organically, just like this. Um, every single episode happens organically. If it doesn't, a matter of fact, this guy will tell you, I start squirming and shit. And I just like, mm -hmm. I don't like that. You know, it, it needs to feel good. It needs to be a good thing. It needs to be a real conversation, a raw conversation. Well, that's, so you how you have some synergy. that's how you unlock stuff too. Like if you just go and like, I actually, this is silly, but you guys probably would appreciate it. Have you guys ever heard of Nardwar? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like I try everyone that comes to Most work at times. interview wherever. Yep. Exactly. Anyone who's going to do any type of interview guys, like, for us at high times, private investigators working for. Her. So that's I, 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 this is that's He's a like, disclaimer. So your mom sleeps here. Uh, what do you think of this? He shows a picture of her. It's like holy shit. Yeah. So that's the disclaimer that I put on is that nobody will ever be able to get like his level of you know of Yo. research done. But every every uh, interviewer that comes to high times, I'm like, you need to study this guy because what you want to create is that surprise and delight where. You, you throw them off their canned answers into a place of like pure happiness. They're happy to do it. And like then, exactly, then they want to like, they want to make a memory with you as opposed to like feeling like they're just doing a job. So you they know? open it's up. It's funny like you say that because exactly. every single person he's ever done an interview with, and a lot of them are people that most people can't get to, um, that don't do interviews at least, yep. they're smiling. Yep. Mm -hmm. They're smiling the whole time. They're smiling, they're, they're like, losing their they mind. They can't believe. Yeah. They're like, what's he going to know about me mm -hmm. that I don't think he would? And then 
a couple of people for sure like man how do you know that how do you know you know pressing him and shit you know like yep. what the you know but that's it's impressive it's, it's impressive it's impressive and he keeps going viral because of it because he's they're capturing a moment that it's just something you can't fake the funk with to have a special moment with someone like that to to be that thoughtful moment of I like you didn't think i was listening but i was listening i think you it's know, because we shit. underestimate joy like yeah. we like mm. again as a society we love to watch the car wreck you know what i mean like and I'm not going to throw anyone's name under the bus, but there are plenty of publications who survive off of, you know, publishing rumors and like whatever. Oh, like, yeah. To me, technically, that's slander. You know what I mean? So like, I, I don't want to be involved in that business. And actually, I will say the reason why High Times has weirdos and not a contributor section is because like, I didn't want it to be Forbes. You know what I mean? Like where all these people are just coming in, getting paid under the table to say all this nice shit about brands, whatever, like. That's it's not, a paper paid to play situation. So I don't, I don't want to say the everyone is thing. because I know plenty of good people over there who are like just doing their job the right way. But like when you create a system that's that big, it's exploitable. Most systems are exploitable. You know what I mean? But like, that's why I don't even take their numbers seriously. I mean, I'm like, I'm like, oh yeah, they, you know, this was a paid publication and the numbers were speculated. And it's just like, it's just so far from reality. Like, I think that actual successful people don't respect it as much because they know the real numbers and shit and they look at it and they're like that's not right like what what is this shit you know where do they get this you have to feel it first you got to know and it. even oh, for yeah. the viewers it's like but you know people do look that oh my god like dang that's because it's people like, still remember forbes bullshit. magazine you know what i mean and yeah. they're like oh the forbes 40 under 40 you so know how many yeah you know 30 how many 40 under, 30 under 40s they have there's like 50 categories what so do you do you just you, you pay five grand and send you in your, gotta, your stats you don't even huh? really got to pay for that one i don't think that one's more like if they think that you're like and listen, i'm not trying to shit on the media but like yeah and wow, i guess that's fucking shit on <laughs> <laughs> i can say this kind of comfortably most you won't see as, us in forbes as i said uh the media exists off advertising right so most media awards were created to reward the people that spend the most money with them right like it's to give Absolutely. them justification for coming back and like you know whatever so like we do try very hard like the high times 100 is definitely was created as a fundraiser super right? cool but we do try very hard to like make sure it's representative now the thing that like most of the heads are not going to like about this is like and it's called the high times most hundred most influential people in cannabis not the most inspiring not the best you know the best business guys or anything like that but like there's like 80 publicly traded cannabis companies now those guys have lost hundreds of millions of dollars so whether or not we think what we're doing is big shit like most of us haven't lost that kind of money it might not be influential influential in a good way but like if they're influential influencing investor millions of dollars from investors into a toilet they're actually doing something really big in this space. We might not like it. I'm not saying they're doing the right thing, but like that. So trying to make something that's truly representative is not going to be popular most of the time because people only want to see the glitz and glam, you know? And like, there are a lot of brands in the space and I don't want to say any names, but I think we might've talked about it the other night where I know they're moving tons of weight. I know their numbers are fucking massive. They're popular. They got new dispensaries popping up all over the place, but you never see anyone consuming their products, right? Those are what I call invisible armies. Like I know they're out there. I know that there are people are coming through, buying their shit, whatever. That's just not a market that I have visibility into. So I do try and keep in mind that like there are so many segments of this thing that like it's hard to generalize it at all at once but again the thing about being representative is trying to talk to each of those markets even if with individual pieces right so if i do something like i said before about like bud porn right the fucking instagram that's really what they love if i put someone like laganja stranja on my instagram page fantastic creative on fucking rupaul's drag race got tons of her own audience like a great person deserving of the light she's going to get destroyed by the community that comes out of the woodwork of the bros and shit like that who like just want to talk shit and just want to see oh, bud man. porn right so it's like this like tightrope to walk of like trying to be representative in the right way at the right time for the right people so again you look at something like forbes you look at like whatever the problem with the contributor section is not necessarily that they're giving all of these people voices it's that 
Now these people who know, oh, if I'm in Forbes, people will take me seriously. I can just f find one guy who's willing to take 500 bucks Charge to write a, a story for me. my course, man. About to, you well, know. some of these guys, I actually got a pitch the All other you day. You got to look rich and then you just sell the fact that you're successful and, hey, I can help you and get the fuck out of here. That's, Any successful person is not... But that's a game. That right Think about yeah. how many people. Look at like Ty Lopez. Game. It is like look, a game. Look at Ty Lopez. Yeah, how much money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen Ran that stupid up a bag? I've well, every it's time all I saw advertising that, and marketing. Well, yes, but every time I saw that fucking ad of him, like, oh, look in my garage, Selling look at all the knowledge info. and all that shit, right? Like the first thing in my head is who the fuck in their right mind would pay this schmuck to fucking whatever? He's advertising on YouTube, right? But again, remember, 50% of the people are stupider than that fucking average person you've got in your head. You know what I mean? So like most of these people are so desperate. And this, that's why the stock market went crazy during COVID. People got Crypto. fucking, they got their inflation check or whatever, the um, stimulus checks, mm -hmm. and they went and spent it on fucking penny stocks and GameStop. You know what I mean? Because fucking Wall Doge Street coin. bets told them, it was, yeah, Dogecoin, because Wall Street bets told them it was going to the moon, you know? And like, listen, some, some of those places are doing better than others. Like the GameStop thing is a fucking... Is an enigma. It was a manipulation. But, but, but that's what fucking crypto is. That's what like a lot of this, the NFT market, a lot of that's just fucking pump and dumps, right? And what like, do you think about the whole fact that, you know, Russia created crypto and crypto was created to, you know, lessen the value of the dollar and, so I don't you know, know take about a lot that. of money away from, you know, all the investors. I don't know What do you that. think about that, Al? I didn't know it was uh, built out of Russia. I didn't know that. So that's new. Well, they're saying that sounds a little conspiracy it. theory. Oh. Well, it is. It is. Well, let me now spin you your know, head. Dan Pina, he's a real controversial guy. Oh yeah, the yeah, billion yeah, dollar he's man. Crazy. He says that, and he <laughs> it's interesting. He as reminds fuck. me but of the But you know, the creator man. of Ethereum's from Russia, and they're you know I I know yes, a lot of Russian people that, dude? that are very yeah. he's have a you, monopoly man. It's, like, fu it's funny though because I know I know a few Russian guys who are now very well off with crypto, and they knew when to set like they were much mm -hmm. ahead of but the so, curve. Okay, but here's the thing. Interesting. You know why? Let me just spin them real quick. Well. It's the same type of thing of like all the fentanyl right now is being produced out of China and sent to Mexico. You think like, oh, they're making it down there. No, all of it Holy is shit. being produced with high access stuff. And, and that's, I watched the Dr. Phil Joe Rogan and it was just mind blowing. We got to talk and, off, off record. Yeah, I got but, some conspiracy about, shit for then, you about but, that. And then it's getting shipped to Mexico. Get then brought on in. record. That's crazy though. You think that, oh, they're making it down in the jungle down there and out in the, you know, that's and you're what like, I thought. No, not a, no, 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 no. It's another ploy on what fucking, it's and, and TikTok. It's a drug TikTok. <laughs> TikTok well, is a psyop. real thing. It's a psyop. That's what I'm saying. Thing. I know about it. It's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, we're getting fucking the deep down the conspiracy. Super boys deep. Want to know but that. the fall of, uh, <laughs> they want that number one spot. And that's what it all comes down to. So, I think both theories I mean, they apply kind of and they both make sense. But either way, um, you know, we get influenced by this, that, or whatever. And like mm -hmm. people get big checks and, you know, all these people got a lot of money to talk about this, that. It's the same well, so, thing, like you said, can be used in reverse now. Well, do you know about Bored Apes? You know how that whole fucking shh. Thing. No, let's get into it. Together. It. Okay, so and this is, is this also, worth what? What is it worth now? I mean, what billions are the of dollars? Worth? Like, yeah. what are the NFTs worth? Though? Oh, I'm sure it's still hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know exactly really? what it is. They're I down, think they're down. down they're, no, 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 ninety percent on average for mm, NFTs. Nah, but I don't know about them. Yeah, but yeah, on average because there's yeah. so many projects that zeroed. They are the they're top still, one. Though. Yeah, that's they're like still Netflix. holding. And, and yeah, and they're not. Don't get me wrong. They're not anywhere near the high that they were, mm -hmm. but like, they're still all worth a pretty penny. Like we, we could not, and I don't know what you guys have, but like, I could not afford to go out and like get a fucking board eight right now. If I wanted one, most projects are in the toilet. You can, whatever those still, you know, whatever, but it's a giant like circle jerk of Hollywood. So CAA who invent, who, you know, represents fucking Snoop Dogg and Eminem and all these fucking guys that are Jimmy Fallon, all these guys who are touting their fucking NFTs, um, their main investor is Sound Ventures. Sound Ventures is one of the main investors in Yuga Labs. So it's just fucking Sound Ventures taking one, using one asset to pump another asset. And that's why all of these celebrities are getting so this, we haven't gotten into like the insider trading and fraud part. Like, so that's why I thought it was funny when the SEC put out that like, oh, we're going after Kim Kardashian fucking bullshit. To me, that read like a, um, like, oh, on the next episode of the Kardashians, Kim gets sued by the SEC. You know what I mean? Like a fucking promo for the show. Um, but they'd rather go over a after a celebrity than like Nancy Pelosi. 
But you know, well, that, that's also who's going to go after Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, yeah. Like that's the thing that I the think. The guy standing next to her. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. that kid who's broken a fucking pot, the house and fucking yeah. where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Um, like that's actually that's the most fucked up part about the way power is structured in this country is like that's like, and I'm not trying to justify by any means what dude did, but like literally it, that's the only way that like a real change like that is going to happen is if some fucking vigilante psychopath goes and like you know actually fucking kills some you it's, know some higher ranking yeah. official you well, know it touches their life it touches your life then it's the same with uh marijuana for the first time right all the older people the older generation were like nope it's bad it's like it's it's worse than cocaine it's worse than the shit that they were doing right yeah 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 but then it's all the propaganda when it started to affect their lives right when people had cancer and they were like oh my god i can eat now oh this balm is working oh i do really enjoy this this isn't what it used what i was told my whole life it is and i watched my parents i watched my stepdad i watched literally everyone in my family slowly go from hardened against it like hardened to like showing me, pick, sending me clippings out of the newspaper, uh, telling me about like keeping up with it is watching the show. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like yep. loving, like, wow, we really, this is really cool. And it's this, I feel like it's the same thing. It's like when it touches your life in a, in that personal way, you have to judge it differently. It's also been demonized to such an extent, like it's amazing to me how many cannabis consumers, how many people participating in the recreational market don't know where legal cannabis came from. I've never heard about Brownie Mary or Dennis Perone or fucking any of the, the AIDS crisis in fucking San Francisco. You know what I mean? Like most of these people, again, like that's why like what was brought up the thing about Laganja is like a lot of this community doesn't even know it's rebelling against itself. You know what I mean? Like part of, like most of the reason why we're here is because of these other people that we now, or I don't want to say we, but like that, like some people in the community steam is like less than them. You know what I mean? When like, in fact, that's why we have the freedoms that we have is because if this, if the government didn't say like, basically like let these people die in San Francisco, like there wouldn't have been these people that had to come out of the woodwork to try and provide a better quality of life for them. Like once you understand cannabis from a medical perspective, like, that's, I think, the big thing, the aha moment, right? Because it was Charlotte Figgy for a lot of people, too, when Sanjay Gupta did the Charlotte's Web thing, right? And they saw, like, this kid who, like, had real relief. There's a video of a guy with Parkinson's, and uh, he takes some tincture, and when he, like, his shakes calm down, he starts talking regularly again. You know, like, you could see real relief. Those are the most powerful, mind-changing devices, right? And, like, we, you could see it happen time and time again no matter the content no matter the people that are doing it like it always resonates better than any type of like oh we're just trying to sell you on why cannabis is beneficial right but the same way that like you heard from your parents don't do this because it's you know whatever they had heard so many things for so long that until they actually can see relief from something it's like it's still in their head, this villain that they've created, you know? And like, unfortunately, that's like how a lot of this shit works, right? Is like a lot of like the, a lot of industry corporate, look, this is actually perfect for the cannabis audience. Corporations in general are like deemed as this like, you know, evil fucking beast of, and you shouldn't like, don't partner with corporate, don't be corporate, whatever. But like really what a corporation is, is a more complex organization to solve more complex problems. Like when you get to a level that like you can't figure out how to do this shit on your own, you need an accounting firm. You know what I mean? You need an accounting team. You need a fucking, you know, like a, a video production team. You need like, you know, like whatever. Um, most people like the ego of it is like, oh no, I can do it all myself or I've gotten myself this far. So I'm all I need. When like realistically, like the idea of bringing in experts to do shit for you, like how do you think the fucking like fortune 500 saves all that money on taxes? It's not because they just sent one of their kids to fucking accounting school and that kid was really good accountant, right? I think they I think hire most, the experts. I think most people just tell themselves that because they're scared to do it. That's possible. Well, it's way more complex it's too. Yeah. It's a, it's a way more complex problem. Now well, you have to manage a bunch of people and be a part of mm -hmm. a team, which, which they may disagree with you and they, things might not go your way. And delegating and, is hard too. That's another thing that like, I think that like is underestimated is just managing in general and trying to, especially, and you guys know this, taking your hands off of the, your baby and allowing somebody else to, to try and push it forward is very difficult for most people because 
they're so ingrained in their ways. No, this is what works. This is how to do it. Like, yeah, that's worked. But like, is it necessarily the best way to do it? Is it whatever? Like most cannabis executives in like from old school cannabis executives have not, don't have MBAs, right? So like they did not go to school to learn about how to compete with all of these other guys. And that doesn't say anything. That's not, they're not less because of that. They just don't know what they don't know. Yeah, you can go back to school and, and spend all that money and whatever, or you can just find someone who already knows that shit and have them do it for you, right? And like, I will say, like the dangers of that is like, you gotta keep, you gotta stay hands on. You, you don't know what a bad deal is until you sign a bad deal. So like, you know, plenty of people have gotten screwed thus far. So I'm not saying just take any deal that's fucking handed to you, right? Definitely have a lawyer review it and shit like that. Not the lawyer of whoever else you're about to do a deal with too. That's- you Yeah, know, don't use their lawyer. Never a good idea that I've seen happen <laughs> so many tip. fucking times. <laughs> Alien um, at law, big shout out. There you go, yeah, right? Yeah. He, he is good people. Yeah, use um, that lawyer. But uh, again, like figuring out how to, how to play against your weaknesses is like the key to breaking through to the next level. Get you some pack odds. Man, that thing must be good, the bro. Bottom. What are you What are you getting on? What is that? What's a that mocha date, frappuccino? Divine Date Smoothie right there, <laughs> Div- boy. Big shout out Earth Cafe. Yeah, like keep Everybody us go lit. pick that up. Divine Date Smoothie with some boba <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> Woo. Nah, but man. John's I, the homie. I ain't worried. It's like I'm at no, the crib yeah. right now, you know? Smoking. I'm, I'm all good, bro. We're hanging the what fuck out. What are you out. smoking? A I don't know, if I've, I don't oh, know what I even one. said thus far. I feel like I've just fucking been rambling. We've been this going on. Yeah, We've yeah, been no, going in, good. but it's good. Yeah. I like this. We're just talking instead of going through like the normal moves. Something we got to cover, though. First time smoking weed. First time smoking weed. Um, okay. So I was, I want to say 12 years old. Um, I was at like my first or second house party ever. Um, and I was with, Damn. A, it was with like, <laughs> a, oh yeah. I mean, well, so I grew up in an area that like, it had a ton of rich kids and like people who like, whose parents just did not give a fuck about them. Right. So like, if anything, like I was on the poor, from the poor side of the town with a Jewish mother who was like on my ass about everything. Right. My friends could do whatever the fuck they wanted from a very young age. So like, if I can get right over to their houses, like we could do whatever the fuck we wanted most of the time. Um, that first party. Uh, or the second party, whatever it was, um, my homies did not fuck with a lot of the people there. So they were just like sitting by themselves and someone asked me like, hey, you guys want to smoke? And I was like, oh, I'd never done that before, but it looks cool. So like, let's try it. And like, so the first time I smoked was with a group of people who like, were pretty much all douchebags, like have no like real interest in like ever hanging out with them again, but I got to smoke and uh, it was dope. But I would say that like, I was definitely still young at that point and it was not like something that was readily available. So I don't think it was until like, I was like maybe second half of 13 that like we figured out that like one of my friend's older brothers was selling weed and could just get it for us. And then it became like, not like, oh, this is a challenge, but like the door is open to us now, you know? That's what's young. That's getting after city, you. So where are you at? You're <clears throat> where, New York where City. Was, yeah. No, no, no. So that was in the city. Um, so I, I was born in Canarsie, but my parents... Mm. That was at my grandmother's house where my parents lived when I was young. Um, so they moved out uh, when I was very young to Long Island uh, and we lived in Franklin Square for a little while and then Syosset. And so Syosset is where this happened. Um, middle school is about when I moved out there. Um, but the f- it's funny thing is like with New York, we're very much out in the burbs, but all of the kids know the city is right there. And like, that's where the cool shit is. So you start going in and like fucking around there from when you're like 14, 15 years old. It's really like when you can comfortably get away from your parents for like a long period of time. You know what I mean? Cause like, it's like an hour each way on the train. Um, so like I was probably like 15, 16 before we started really like, you know, fucking around and like, you know, like getting like for stupid shit, like sweet 16s and stuff like that. Like, oh, this person's got a limo bus. It's going to take us out to the city. And then like, you know, we'll take the ride there and we'll figure out how we're going to get home late night type shit. Um, But also I was really into art from a young age. So like I was like trying to like scope out fucking graffiti and fucking shit like that, like way younger than I probably should have been. Um, So because of that, like I had a lot of older friends that kind of let's say showed me the arts in uh, ways that like I, my friends started, my close friends started doing mushrooms when I was like 15 years old. And that was, I was like, 
I'm too young for this. You know what I mean? This is like, this is a little bit crazy. Like I was, I still kind of like, when we talk about the propaganda, like I still kind of believed like my brain wasn't fully formed yet. You know what I mean? So like if I fucking ate too many mushrooms, I could just like mush in on itself or something like that. Do you believe that though? I mean, I kind of do believe that. I mean, I believe that your brain is still forming, but I don't believe like the, like, oh, you're going to like like 15. I don't think it's good to mess with things, you know? Here's the thing. Um, Most mental illness presents itself at the late, uh, late teens, early twenties. So I will be, I would be lying if I said to you that I didn't watch anyone go crazy. Like I watched several friends who like definitely were slightly off beforehand and like, you know, apparently had family histories of things, lose themselves to things like acid. Um, but yeah, like a couple of people went on that trip, never came back. Yeah. One of my that's friends exactly got cool. what I was going to say that I, I would hear about that. And I, that's why I was like, I, to this day, I've maybe done like a micro dose of acid, but like, and that wasn't like, so acid is someone the like best put drug. it on my tongue type shit. But like, other than that, which I'll, I'll say it was, you know, it was enjoyable. It's it was definitely a fun. blast, yeah. but, um, it's just a like time I said, commitment. super micro, but that's one of those things that I would hear about through friends and friends where everybody like, yeah, like he, you know, they went on the trip and never, you know, I knew someone personally that did. So, but I think it's when you, like you say, you're walking on that line already of like, maybe you haven't been bipolar yet, but you know, so cause like it happens. It's if you have a family history. <clears throat> so you know? my buddy, he was like the mushroom guy growing up, right? He's from West Palm beach, Florida. And he literally was like, the guy like how we are with weed he was always that with mushrooms like knew the names of ones when you would see him in the ground he'd be like oh cubensis uh you know he would know like its real name and he did a he would go out and pick them in fields because there's a lot of open fields in west palm obviously and literally was like you know what i wonder what would happen if i ate mushrooms every day for like 30 days and would do these like experiments on himself where at the end he's eating like handfuls to get right well he obviously had a younger brother and his younger brother this is his obviously had a younger brother (laughs) and so this dude i have a great story about this guy too but but uh he had he would eat mushrooms and get into the same movement his younger brother had a psychotic break and was like driving down the highway the wrong way in car like to the point where like now he has to have people around him at all time but it all started with like pushing it too far at an early age and having yeah. that break and maybe it would have already happened but he so, put pushing it it's like with steroids and if you have a weak heart and you don't know it doesn't necessarily take steroids a bunch it's like well maybe you would have had a heart attack anyway but you don't even not. need to abuse it though like if you and like again like so this one kid who was a roommate at one po- point of mine while this was happening so it was i don't want to all right it was his 18th birthday. Um, and let's get into it. I'm like, I'm just, tr- I'm trying to figure out like how <laughs> I can obfuscate if there's anything that's like detailed. Well, that's, that's the thing. So like, I don't want to like, I don't want to blow up his spot. and all this shit on thing. I mean, it's getting crazy. I don't think, I don't, I don't know that he's even aware of, you know, existence anymore. So I don't know, whatever, mm-hmm. but he's going to call you and be like, man, I seen that episode. Well, we found <laughs> out later that his father had killed himself oh, and fuck. like whatever. And it tur- his younger brother had something later in life, but it was his 18th birthday. And so we all were just getting into acid and we're like, fuck it, let's do acid for your 18th birthday. Uh, and he never came back. It was, it was very first time. Um, no way. Wow. Yeah. And Did then too I had, much or what? Like, uh, no, no, like one tap, just like he had, like he had this, so bad that he would like talk to pictures afterwards like it was like a it was you think that do you think it i had to live with him for a, a choice year bro. Or no it was no real. no this was uh-huh. like a so we so we spent time trying to like figure out how to handle this because he, he was living with us at the time it was think four, about it four like a us. punch in the head and cte i might you might got you might get punched in the head five times and get it you might get punched in the head one time he might not he might have to just get slapped around and get you know what i'm saying like with like everyone no i'm saying but like everyone has a different so for his boundary one tab was enough to push him over where for other people Bro, you're like i like, could take five but you know what the well, crazy here's the part thing. is it's also is the that time. there's like no disclaimer no no, no, no but my it's thing is like, could you imagine that was like the up against the hit. side of the bathtub that was where it gets real but you hold know, on so that's slippery man my point in saying that and that whole story is that that was timing that was because he was of this age where this stuff could present itself that like if we had waited till he was 30 he might not have ever presented those things you know what i mean because like it was there but and like like he developed full-blown schizophrenia like he was like he like 
broke into my room in the middle of the night because he thought we were all in there talking about him, like screaming, like stop talking about me type shit. Like when your brain is playing tricks on you, you don't know. You know what I mean? Like it just, it seems real. So like you can't tell that like, you know, this is out of whack. That was my first friend who fucking went out of it. My second, one of my best friends, and I got to be very discreet with this one, but like he got pulled and like he went away for a couple months and then came back. And like, he definitely, I would say he came back a little bit cosmic, like definitely not like, like, oh, I'm into fucking star signs or anything like that, but just still a little bit out there, like further out than he was but back, you know, and like, like lives a normal life, got married, has kids, like he's doing fine now. But the first kid, he just, that was, it was the timing. It was what happened to him and it just presented it. So like, I do definitely think that there's something about how mature you are, but I also think it's to some degree, like the, the your chemical makeup, like, you know, at, by this point in your life, if you haven't had a psychotic break or anything like that, like I would try acid if I were you because it's it's great. It's the most fun shit ever. Um, it's the time commitment. You got to like block out like 12 hours to like be fucking weird, but you're going to have the best. Like I've been on acid on the beach making up fucking stories about every grain of sand. You know what I mean? Like weird shit, like just like seems justifiable and exciting, you know? Um, but again, like it is something that I consider to be I don't know, man. You might Let's go on that sacred. trip and you might not come back. You might not come back. Or you come back a different person, maybe a better I one. Mean, I mean, speaking did. of this, though, this weekend, <laughs> I'm doing a ceremony. Oh, yeah? What kind? Ayahuasca. Okay. Ayahuasca is- Start beating the drum. I haven't done ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is intense, bro. That's like- Three nights, bro. <laughs> that's- uh, Have you done 5-MEO? No. Okay. I've only done mushrooms. You've only, only done fuse, baby. You've only done mushrooms. You're going straight to ayahuasca. Well, we have some close friends that uh, are well versed in this. That that like they do this every once yeah, in a while it's, to, it's, for it's, creative it's, business ideas for to realign. And he he talks about it so positively. And he's like, "What do you great, think about that? You think I'm fucked?" So <laughs> no, I would say you're fucked. Um, so listen, honestly, the, no. the, it's a true let go. I mean, the you reason let go, why right? yeah. I yeah. like five meo DMT, and I've never done ayahuasca, so I can't I can't comment specifically on what that experience is. But um, five meo DMT, where other drugs are like mind expansive, I would say five meo is more like uh, extraction, like you basically pass out and wake up with a fortune cookie from the universe. That's like, Hey, here's what's wrong with you. Um, and you can that's be better. Like ayahuasca what, is significantly more intense than that. So yeah, like throwing up like purging. So bufo, which is like the, the toad ceremony bufo, I think is like the Spanish word for, or maybe it's just a type of toad or something like that. But, um, there's combo and then there's bufo, which combo is the one where they burn you. And that's where you purge first. I haven't done a full, uh, ceremony like that but that was like what i was working my way up to ayahuasca is like a couple notches quite a few notches above that what do you think about peyote couple so peyote is the other one ayahuasca is a couple that, notches above that yeah so peyote, this, this is a good bit. one though you don't so freak peyote, him out no no no, no. He needs this to is, go on this, no, 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 this is this is so peyote and ayahuasca are that's they call it the fucking what's it the mescaline and the grandmother and the grandfather yeah so the thing with peyote that I've been told from like my OGs is like, if you want to do peyote, you got to grow the cacti. And when the fucking cacti blooms, that's the universe saying you're ready. But with ayahuasca, I've been told that like, <laughs> I don't want to fucking scare you with this, but I've been told that like you, like the grandmother calls you, you know what I mean? Like you're like, oh, you know shit. when it's time. So um, I just, fuck. I haven't gotten my calling yet, but again, like I, I'm, and okay, the scary thing about this is like <laughs> the grandmother you don't calls know. you, huh? You don't know. Damn, my grandma's not doing so well right now. <laughs> you don't know what it means to like surrender until you're in it, right? So like the whole idea of like and five meo is like a good entrance to that because like really like it, you basically just say like all right, I like you have to. I've seen people not have good trips on it. Let's say that. And that's like when you try and hold on and you try and like, like your ego really is dug in and you think you can control the experience and that this is what it's supposed to do. And then like it, the plant very much teaches or the, the poison very much teaches you like you're not the driver of this and shit. And is that, that smoked, correct? The five, that smoked. Yeah. Five, e five MEO. MEO, five MEO. Okay. 
See, that's why I, that one makes me a little where this I feel like is dosed, like where, where he's going to be doing it. It's very thought have out. Have you done it before? No, I have not. But I've been around it a few Are times. Are you going to the same experience? No, I'm not. I'm letting them go first. <laughs> and then I told them, yo, if I'm, I'm down to go the second time, let's film it. So Cody's a guinea pig. Oh, well, no. Yeah. Kinda. Yeah. Kinda. <laughs> I'm going with Rex, though. He's yeah. already been a bunch of times. Uh, so, okay. you know, yeah. our, our homie Rex so, Power SI. I'm going with him. So it's like, all right, you know. You know, I'm just going to tell him, bro, listen, if shit goes south, just call the fucking ambulance right away, bro. Tell him to get the helicopter and shit. You that's should see not the gonna, inspiring, though. You know Rex saying, has though? inspiring. Uh, you know, I I, that's the fear, though. You think, what if, what if some, You're I have gonna some get medical out, shit or you know, a bad trip? Then he'll be like the cop who ate the brownie and then like, I'm fucking dying. <laughs> nah, nah, yeah, this the is different, dying. The thing that you got to <laughs> keep in mind. Different, man. <laughs> They're like, go lay down, you fuck. These drugs make you, uh, <laughs> you've heard of the term ego death, right? Right. Like they make yes. you like be outside yourself. Yeah. Right. So like the only thing that like I would be, you know, scared of. And the reason why I probably wouldn't want this shit filmed is like you're going to probably purge. So like if you oh, throw up sure. on yourself Cry. or like, you throw know, up, shit your pants shit, or something like that, that, like you I'm probably don't need I'm, that. I feel footage. prepared for that. <laughs> you know? Everybody, Dude, I, whoosh, real rap. Get on the Patreon for real. We're, the second <laughs> ceremony, we're getting bigs there. You already know I'm going three nights. If night one doesn't go well, I'm out. Like, I don't I'm, think no, it's. No, I, it's I mean, I'm like sticking that. it out, but it's in. like if it's like something that's like, yo. I think like, you're in the experience. Up. I don't think it's I think like first a, night, second you start night are with a, a little cup. Yeah. See, here's what he was going to get into: is that the shaman administers it as you're ready for it. They mm -hmm. got to see it first. It's real mild because they only give you a little bit. Have you been like on a diet or fasting or anything like that? I'm vegan right now. Like because of this. Yes. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Because you know, like, there's like a whole like yeah. you're supposed to follow like our, dietary our homies, stuff. Do, he does it like every quarter. And I he, was supposed to stop smoking, but you know, no, I get it. That's Rex said he one. smokes. So actually, wait, so, ready? Yeah, yeah. So we talk about five meo. My fortunes. Um, the first one was basically that I spend too much time living in the past or living in the future that I'm missing the now. Um, the second one was that. Uh, um. Oh, uh, I plan for more failure than I do for mm -hmm. uh, what's it called for success. And uh, explain that. And, and, and can you explain how this came to you? So, okay. So basically, and uh, this is what I mean about like not understanding how what it means to surrender. Like you basically passing out. Like it's like you're, you smoke, you inhale this stuff and. Like there's a shaman there that's playing some music, blowing some tobacco smoke, hitting you with a little feather. Like it's like a, it's honestly, it's like a funny experience to like watch on the wall from. And like, I did watch like three people do it before me. So it was like, you know, I, I did kind of know what I was getting into before whatever. Um, but you really just kind of like you inhale this stuff and you basically pass out. And like, it's basically the, the letting go is like letting yourself disappear and like, and fade out it kind of feels like you're dying. You know what I mean? Like you don't, cause you don't know what this like loss of consciousness is. And again, like you can hold on to some degree, like you can like try and fight it and like, you know, whatever. When you let go, you pass out and then you basically wake up and as the world's rematerializing, you have like a, like, it's not like, like a fucking fortune pops up and whatever. You just hear like a voice in your head that like gives you a message. And at least this is my experience, right? And I've done it three times. Um, the first experience I said was that you're living uh, in the past or the future, you're not planning for now. Second was um, you don't plan for success. You uh, uh, And basically that one, I believe, was more like any time that I'm worried about something not working, I'm usually thinking about six different ways that I could save it as opposed to like, what am I going to do if this shit actually works? You know what I mean? And like, I'm never prepared for like, and this sounds stupid because it's only like, you know, it doesn't happen all the time or whatever, but like, I don't have a victory speech ever. You know what I mean? I just prepare that it's going to be somebody else and we're going to try harder next year. You know what I mean? Um, so there's that. And then the third one was cigarettes and that I need to stop smoking. Um, and like, it was very clearly like I came out of it. Not I felt, weed? No, no, no. I felt, I felt nauseous. And like, I saw a pack of Newports in my head, like, like very clearly, like no words, no nothing, just like a pack of Newports sitting there. And then like, I thought I was going to throw up and I went to throw up and there was a pack of my actual cigarettes that I had finished in the trash, the, whatever. And so it was like, I saw this Damn. thing before I saw it. And did you throw up? 
Uh, no, I didn't throw up. I was able to like, you know. So you went to a shaman ceremony and you oh, did yeah, this. Oh yeah, three times. But we did, okay. it, we did it once at high times. Because some people would be like, I got some DMT and they got like a little no, fucking no, no. vape we did like, It's like, dude, no, I'm not. Like if, if I'm going to do no. it, like I really want to like, we like did the natural, way we're doing this. We did naturally extracted poison. Like none of the fucking, yeah, what's it called? Cool. Uh, uh, what's it? Uh, synthetic shit? Yeah, yeah. None of that. Like, so that's the only guys, stuff I've seen is the synthetic. I've seen powder yeah. too. Yeah, that's a synthetic. Yeah. So they it's all because like the poison is not like liquid. Like it is like still like the even the synthetic is of looks like what the real stuff is because like it's dried and fucking you know whatever and then you're like basically free basing it crazy so were they doing other stuff that night what do you mean? at the ceremony or whatever no like, no 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 this was, it was time. a bufo ceremony okay. so again like if you're gonna do combo that's like a much longer grosser process so like that's usually like more ret retreat style where it's like all right first we're gonna purge and you're gonna get all the negative shit out and then you're gonna do this bufo experience and like get to where the next level is you know um i will say the crazy thing like everyone always says like oh i took acid and i fucking changed my life or i had this fucking whatever like, <laughs> i just thought it was too long i was like god is this over yet wow this isn't like like 10 hours in i'm like damn this shit's still going but Holy also shit. your your brain is your attention span is so short your mind is all over the place with acid that i always kind of laughed at the idea of like oh you're a different person like you're a different person a million times during the trip you know what i mean like that's you you're rolling through every person you could be basically um with bufo i felt a lasting change like i would like like after the first experience like the next like month and like i'm not saying it's like still there like every time or whatever but like if I get a whiff of certain like incense or, or like, you know, smell of something like that, like I'll have in my head, like, it's not that doesn't matter that much. You know what I mean? It's allowed me to like live more in the now than, you know, I had been. And like, again, that's definitely like, uh, in my own head and me, you know, seeing my own experience that very anecdotal, you know what I mean? But like, it's the first drug that I've experienced that hasn't just been like, Oh, this was fun. But, <clears throat> something that like I actually think helped me, you know? See, I mean, and that's the positive. You come out of it, even if you take one thing out of it of like, mm, I need to change this way about me, or I need to think of things like this differently than <laughs> you're like, damn, was it worth throwing open shit myself for three days? Well, and you, you or should I have just taken the signs? You'll huh? only know some people got to go you, through that. That's what I was about to say. You'll only some people know this extreme and, and I, you won't know till way after. Definitely one of those people that's just got to like, it's like, honestly, it's like getting your ass handed to you in a fight the first time. Mm -hmm. You realize a lot as a man, you're like, oh shit. Like, you know, I think that day is when you like really start learning respect and like, you know, respect fellow man and like all that stuff. Like you can tell when someone's never had that situation or whatever, like, I don't know. There's just certain mental shifts that like, you know, dramatic experiences where you're like, it does change you. I like think you're, business, you're a different person. Business as well. When you yeah, get yeah, done real in dirty, deal, yeah. you'll never forget it. It's like, oh, yeah. uh, 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 because yeah. man, when I, yeah. you, it's like a lasting scar on yeah. people. Yeah, I agree. This is going to sound like some like fucking pseudo evolved bullshit. But um, the way that I kind of try and judge people now is based on where I believe they are in the understanding of their own self. And so like, damn, young and that sounds again a it's lot deep. deeper it sounds a lot I deeper like than that. it is but more like are you like is your ego still driving your conversation because if it is it's going to be a different conversation than like a conversation of what's actually the best thing right and like i actually this has been my experience it, it's helped me in business because like with most executives and like money guys you can't really give them an idea you got to kind of reverse engineer the idea out of them right so it's like the kind of thing where you're like oh shit that thing's got wings it's got fucking a beak it's got web feet and then they say oh shit it's a duck and you're like oh fuck you're so smart how did you figure that shit out you know what i mean and then all of a sudden your idea is implanted in them and they are producing it right um i think that like a lot of people oh i started to say this earlier so i, I the rich kid syndrome i think this is actually right before we we started but Kids who grew up with money, kids who grew up with housekeepers, and like I'm not trying to say anything against these people, but they make they tend to make more of a mess when they go places because they're used to someone coming around and picking their shit up after them. They're not trying to fuck your shit up. They're not trying to, you know, make a mess in your place. They just assume that you have a housekeeper like they do. You know what I mean? So like understanding 
how people approach situations is usually a good way of figuring out the quickest way to get to your goal, right? Like if you know somebody's going to come in super bullheaded and like this is what they want to do and like, you know, you can... The goal is just they want to put their name all over something that you want to do. Okay, no problem. Here you go. They think, no, here's a check or here's the fucking, here's how much it costs, like your foot in the bill. Okay, boom. If both things work out, it's a it's a great situation, right? But if you just went in, you're like, oh no, I want to do this. And this person's like, oh no, I just want to do this. You would never get to the next stage. It's like, that's what happens with a lot of social conversations. It's just like, I want to tell you my point and I want to tell you my point. And like, okay, well, you know, instead of listening to the other point, you're just shouting your points at the other person. And like, Actually, we did a really cool piece on weirdos um, last week uh, that Mike Glazer wrote, and it's a uh, it's a play that is about uh, internet interactions, and it's basically kind of it, it's more like he made like a, a fictional version of like what happens with like a lot of Instagram posts and kids trying to come in and seem you know so intellectual and smarter than whoever else is in the game. You know what I mean? And then so they comment on one post and like talk a bunch of shit on the person's thing. And then they post something else and the person comes and talks a bunch of shit on their thing. And then basically by like the third one, they realize that like they're basically saying the same thing. Neither of them really know shit. And they're just trying to, you know, trying to figure out and be happy. You know what I mean? I think that's like and I've said this a few times already, but like that's like a lot of what life is, right? Is people just want to see feel seen. They want their opinions reflected back at them. They want, you know, to matter in this difficult and uncaring world, right? So being able to like, you know, help people feel that way is I think something that's that's very, very special and uh, something that fortunately I get to do quite a bit. I think that's kind Absolutely. of like where the origin of a high times cup comes from feeling special, feeling, re- feeling competition rewarded. in general. Yeah. And just feeling like you're the best or you're one of the best. Well, And also, you know, the thing that people forget that's about what this, drives people. The thing that people forget about the cannabis cup that like realistically, like every time someone's like the, Oh, this person bought a cup or any they of those paid, conversations man. came up. The Dude, weed they had to have paid the shit. I mean, was if you created, look at any event or any competition though, people say shit like that. But of course yeah, yeah, yeah. it's always Rappers those fakes. It's always oh, the people no, who didn't lose. Who didn't through win. The game. Yeah. You're just like, I mean, you hear everything. It's so. always the people who didn't win who have some excuse. Yeah. But the reason why fundamentally it was created in the first place is because the guys wanted to smoke the best weed. Mm-hmm. They wanted to say, this is the best. So this is what I'm going to smoke all the time. Let's compare them all side by side and see who's got the fucking kill. And like, that's always been the game. So like when people are saying like when Danny Danko and, Tr- and Sean Black were running the shit and people are like, oh no, it's bought. Like you think, first of all, you don't know who all the judges are. So it's not even like you can go out and buy out all the judges and say, oh, whatever. But even besides that, like you think Danny is going to sell you his integrity? Like, of course not. Like he's trying to figure out what's the best so that he knows what's the best. So he can go to provide value to his community and say, hey, this is the shit. You know what I mean? But like to say that like, oh no, it was just like, it was just created to make money or whatever. If it was just created to make money, then no one would ever buy into it. No one would ever care about it. And like, actually, this is the first year I'm doing the Emerald Cup, which I'm very fucking excited about. But like, you see all these other competitions, right? And like, it's the reason why I want to be involved and why I enjoy participating in all these things is everyone does shit differently. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And I think that like, also everyone has different priorities. And I think that like people forget that brands are made of people and not like that. They're just like this robot you know, entity. Yeah. Or like this, like this the corporate robot that says you can do this and you can't do that. Like a lot of what I've done with high times has been, you know, I didn't, I asked for forgiveness, worst case scenario. You know what I mean? Like I haven't really had to say, Oh, do this. Or, or they haven't really told me, Oh, do this. Or you have to do this. You know what I mean? But I think that like a lot of, the experience for a lot of people is it's subjective and in order to like to really personalize and and show people be reflective of everyone you have to be a lot of different things and that's it's hard to be a jack of all trades and you know and not do one thing specifically but that's again when i'm getting back to curation why I think like a lot of, and we see it in the brand space now, right? Like a lot of the people who are just curating a good menu and getting out there, like someone like Doja Pack, like that's half the battle. P- being able to speak, the, the cannabis market is very reactionary, right? Like it, it says, okay, everyone's buying lemon cherry gelato now. So we're all going to fucking grow lemon cherry gelato and, or, you know, where they were growing runs and now they call it lemon cherry gelato, whatever the fucking case may be. Um, but yeah, they're hopping on, they're hopping on what's on the fucking, what's on the wave of the right now. Um, people who are able to say, 
or not even necessarily say, because like, who the fuck am I, right? I don't actually command any whatever, but just by showing and saying to people like, hey, look at fucking, look at this brand or look at this brand. They don't have to resonate with every single strain. They don't have to resonate with every story I write. If they get like, actually, you're going to see it right now. Um, the last weirdest piece I wrote was about talking shit. And it was just because I'm very fed up with a lot of people who are like not doing anything worthwhile, feeling qualified to like talk down on all these people who are like trying to survive right now. You know what I mean? Not that I think, not that I want to say anybody specifically is doing the right thing or the wrong thing or anything like that. But the point of the piece is really that fucking, if you're not in the shoes, you're not really qualified to make the decision anyway. You know what I mean? The next piece is all about the trap and how like the trap market exists because there's no real customer service on the recreational market. They care about profit margins, whereas the trap has to hear from their customers if shit's not fire or they don't hear from them again. You know, that's a lot more visible on the ground level. It's a lot harder to see when you're running a dispensary and you have to like communicate that through bud tenders. Right. So like how we evolve to the next level and how we figure out how to like stay cool and communicate like you know what matters to everyone is important that that new piece is literally about why this culture cares so much and it's because they've been fucked over so many times and because they've you know like you know bought weed that wasn't good enough or they thought something was hyphy and it turned out to be fucking cardboard terps you know what i mean like creating spaces to curate or, or empowering curators is like, it's why you guys are successful. You know what I mean? Like that's what that's for, obviously you guys are great interviewers. So I'm not trying to, you know, downplay that <laughs> skill, but Dude. most importantly, you're, you're pulling in people who people want to hear from. And but I'm not, is, I'm well, not this necessarily is a including. machine built off collaboration. So that's, that's the point I'm getting to, right? It's like if more people in the industry looked at like, like how Doja did when he fucking with the pack with everybody's fucking name on it, right? Like if more people looked at this, like it was a team sport and less like we're all whatever, again, where they are on their fucking ego journey. If they realize, hey, this world is a lot bigger than me and I'm just a player here and I can be a part of a bigger equation. I think that's actually the biggest pill that the traditional market needs to swallow right now is like, you the, the best future for you might not be you being the ceo of a company like especially if sure you don't have an mba you don't know half the shit but if you could partner with someone again the right person who actually has your best interest at heart you might just be able to create the perfect situation where now you have this legal you cover can still be an entrepreneur exactly and, and you have your, your runway doesn't matter you know like you said that's the death of the ego and you'll have more niche focus, right? It's like you take on the right partner and they balance the equation in the, with the right partnership to where it's like, oh, now I get to focus on my strength. He's focusing on his strength. Look, or, Alien Lab is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. Like Ted, like that's why he did his partnership, right? Is because like he wanted to focus on getting the best plants possible and not any of the fucking bullshit of distribution and stuff like that. And these guys had all of those tools. That's a perfect marriage. Now, granted, there's always minutia and whatever. And I think that to some degree, we talked about this earlier, but everyone thinks their baby's the cutest, right? So like the second you give up the keys to your baby and someone starts doing something that maybe you wouldn't have done, you're going to feel a certain way. But like to me, like, and what I've been trying to tell like my friends, especially the traditional guys is like, especially, and this is, I've been planning for the worst. I was saying this before about always, you know, planning worst case scenarios. And like, especially since Biden made that announcement, I feel like, uh, things are going towards the, uh, uh, pharma. I don't know that. I think we're going to get rescheduling. I don't think we're going to get descheduling, um, oh, which wow. scares the fuck out of me. Right. Yeah. How would that mean? But what means that basically, big it? it basically means the big pharma gets the industry because it becomes a controlled substance like fentanyl. Right. Where that only said, if you have a license can you handle the product. To, which it starts getting to be very fair, so then they start what well, hold taxing on. it more. To be fair, that's very similar. Too, huh? That's actually very similar to how the tradition, the market today operates, except it's in pharmacies as it's in dispensaries as opposed to pharmacies, mm -hmm. right? So, like again, it would give this to people who had certain licenses to could to whatever. Maybe in the perfect world, they would say, okay, we're going to flip all of these licenses that we did by the state side into pharma licenses and whatever, but what might happen is that all of these big money interests might now own the market. Go. And what they're going to do is come in and they're going to pick the brands that they like and they're going to buy them out and they're going to fucking whatever. Now, 
because they'll set a they'll put a rule set out like a Florida. You had to be a cultivating orchids for 30 years. Exactly. It's like, what the fuck does that have to do with growing weed? It takes away the it's free like, market. Well, the, well, yeah. It's, but uh, that's what we're it's in. like, oh, you want $20 million. But oh, that, okay, okay. But that's what uh, we're in, right? Like, we're not like, cannabis is not like tomatoes in California. It's not like right? any like, other plant substance. It's like, people thought it was like growing CBD and learn quickly that that's not, hemp ain't the same as weed either. So I think that that's the biggest, the biggest problem for most investors coming into the space is none of them are farmers. None of them are used to dealing with produce, right? They're used to dealing with CPG shit and saying, okay, like, or, or tech or whatever, right? They're saying, okay, let me put my money in and fucking 10 X. That's why I don't want to throw anybody names out there. I'm sure your listeners know who this is, but like when somebody's making a pitch about uh, driving the cost of production down to a hundred dollars a pound, like that sounds good to investors because, oh, we're cleaning up the margins and shit like that. But like, they're not recognizing that like, if you grew, if Tropicana grew a bunch of oranges that had no flavor, no one want any fucking Tropicana oranges anymore. You know what I mean? They're not the fucking kingpin because they figured out how to make the margins the best. They did over time because, you know, whatever, but that's, this is actually, this is interesting. Um, Tropicana does not uh, do uh, automatic harvesting. They still use migrant workers to pick all the fruit because they lose less fruit from that way than uh, fucking automating the production, right? So why is cannabis going to be different? We see all these people trying to ma- automate the trimming process and automate the, f- the, what's it called process? We know- Automate everything. We know yeah. that when you're with the plants and when you're giving them the vibrations and you're, commu- you're communicating with them and you're fucking playing music for them and shit like that, that's the kind of shit that the vibrations of it is what things respond to. It's, it's like that with kids. It's like that with fucking anything, right? If you put energy and love into something, it'll blossom in a stronger way than if a fucking robot does it, right? And- I think that like everyone is trying to turn cannabis into something that they could just, you know, add to the fucking P and G portfolio, as opposed to recognizing that they're going to have to, you know, deal with a, a very, a very hands-on industry. That's ex- I was exactly say that to what you're saying. Uh, can't, the reason you're saying is like hands-off approach, automate everything, even past the vibrations and even music and stuff is that just like people plants like to have hands-on interactions they like to be touched they like to okay maneuver you know you move it around you're making sure it's like if you're there every day to make sure every leaf's taken off if you're there every day to make sure oh we need a foliar you start to read this plant like you read a person it's like having a baby i would i consider somewhat where you once i'm sure mothers can see like oh they need to go to the bathroom and all they have to do is see the face it's the same with looking at plants after a while you're like oh we need to do a foliar We need to, we need to, you get a gut reaction of what's going on in this plant. And it's the same thing. If if you automate everything, where's that gut reaction of like, just knowing something and, and being able to pivot and being able to, no, it's, we spray on Mondays and we foliar and we, uh, we, we feed this way. It's very just, this is the way we do it. And the plant will work into that system versus figuring out like, like, no, it's, it's more like a person. It has parameters. You got to kind of you know, keep it in this, this zone. And yeah, the problem with cannabis is that it's not easily quantifiable in Mm -hmm. data. And we can see this even with like terping terpenes and like how science doesn't really agree with the heads in terms of what terpenes are doing in the equation, because it's such a small percentage of the plant. And because like when they retest it in rats, they're not seeing any different, but it is a very subjective and personal experience thing that like anecdotally, we can very clearly see different terpenes interact with my body chemistry a different way. Right. So it's a, we're all of the art in cannabis right now is in that minutia of the non-quantifiable, right? So like, even if you automate your facility, right. And the numbers could be perfect, but again, you can see with your eye, like, okay, this is something different in a way that the machine can't pick it up. And like, it's weird because like, realistically, it should be able to that the the machines should be more responsive than we are, right? They should be able to pick up the most, the slightest change in whatever and react accordingly. But the problem is the machines are not really designed to, or or they're not, I guess you shouldn't say designed because they are designed to grow cannabis, but like they're designed to fill a purpose. They're not designed to consume and understand what good product is. And I think that's another big problem with our industry, right? Is it's like, for a large part driven by people who are weekend passive consumers, right? Who like want to smoke once every, you know, when they're on the golf course or something like that with their bros, like not like, oh, I'm going to get off work and I'm going to go fucking light up a blunt, you know? And I think 
that's actually been one of the biggest pitfalls for the cannabis industry so far. I said before, like it's about creating space for the cheerleaders, but everyone is creating products and trying to cater to these cheerleaders that are not consuming at the same rate of the people who actually live this life, right? So like to me, the same way with the magazine, I want to make it shit more approachable for everybody, right? Like I think that like the problem with the space is we're not trying to make the shit that people love more approachable. We're trying to make the cheap shit fit into like all the other boxes, right? And like, oh, we'll put up this in a pretty jar and make it pink and say this is for women. Or, oh, we'll fucking, you know, put this for, you know, make it like hardcore OG. This will be for fishermen. Ex exactly, right? Like, yeah. How many fucking fish? <laughs> there was a dispensary and I was working with a group for a while and they're like, we're going to open a dispensary and it's going to be based on yachting. And I was like a yachting dispensary in my head. I was like, what is that? Like 1% of 1% of people that would be like, and, and then I always go into like you, these people, like a lot of dispensaries I was just having this, this, this talk with a guy who runs a couple dispensaries in LA, like literally last night while smoking a joint. And, and I was like, Bro, that guy buys an eighth once a month. When the fuck when, does he when when Doja, when Pat Gods, when when Blackley, when when on and on and on, you know, Bobby Trill team, they spend a thousand dollars if they go into it, five hundred bucks if they go into a dispensary and they do it, you know, if it was worthwhile, right? Or or an LA Kush clinic or some version of that. But even more importantly than and just supporting it, they're actually consuming it, oh, right? Like talking that's about like, it. Tr other people are trying it. Yeah. There are plenty of money guys who are going into the dispensary and buying plenty of their own shit just to try and fucking goose up their numbers and, and look dope for their fucking homies, right? Yo, what up? It's Blackleaf. I'm here at Grow Generation. And guess what? Drip Hydro storming the market. All the best growers I know are switching to it. And guess what? There's a reason. Because it's preserving terps. I keep hearing that. Preserving terps. And that's why we're here with Sunshine. Facility advisor, facility manager overall the man with drip hydro listen to why it's different man what's going on guys sunny here with drip hydro thing is at the end of the day we just wanted to make a simple clean cost effective nutrient line that nobody has really seen on the market right now nobody uses really our chelation formulas uh the micronutrients that we have pulled to make this line is really just what makes it overall bringing that consistency and quality back to what we want to see in growing herb again and overall at the end of the day it's still really light on your wallet it's a five-part nutrient line and again if you're not staying sterile or you have a big facility and you don't want to run rock wool and you want to run a mix of cocoa with an enzyme or something you don't even have to run flow with it so at the end of the day it's just saving you money on your wallet while bringing the consistency and the quality of terps back we wanted to bring the terps back and bring the soul back to growing versatility cost effective and quality i mean what else can you ask for drip hydro first smoke of the day black leaf approved peace so we got a special offer for you guys whether you go in person or you order online any grow generation over 60 nationwide retailers the code is first smoke 10 and you're going to get 10 percent off an additional 10 percent off your already discounted price use the code first smoke 10 tell them the first smoke family sent you they're going to take care of you Support the show, hop on the Patreon. We got new shows dropping, we got off the mic. We have so much stuff in store for you guys and stuff dropping every single week. Hop on the Patreon, first smoke of the day. New shows, checking in with Pat Gods and Blackleaf. We're doing a live each month and a lot of other shit. Off we the haven't mic. told you guys yet. Make sure you get on the Patreon. We'll see you guys soon, peace. I, I think that like the thing that like a lot of people forget, especially the people who are like passive consumers is like, they just think weed is weed. Mm -hmm. And like, again, it is important for us, quote unquote, navel gazers to remember that like, we are the minority in this situation and we care way more than most people do. But it is about trying to figure out how to like, again, make that shit that we really care about that much more visible and apparent to everyone else and not just seem like the we weird top of the mountain weed shit that's the most expensive because they only produce a fucking room of it when they could be doing 10 but they're just like they want to do one so they can fucking charge you six times as much to call it super small batch you know what i mean so like again like there's there are are tricks of the trade let's say all over the game and like we do live in or do live and work in an industry that was designed by or not designed by but like founded by outlaws it wasn't, you know, mo most of the OGs that were here are used to getting ripped off. So they have to operate accordingly. You know what I mean? And you can't 
it's the same thing about the rich kids, right? Like you can't hold it against them, but if you understand the perspective they're coming from, it makes it that much easier to deal with them. And so like, again, the thing that I would say, that I say to all these guys to remember is like, yeah, the race to the bottom sucks right now. No one's making money. No one's able to sell it because the supply is way outpaced the demand. And fortunately, I don't know if you guys remember this, but like really hard to say no to a $50 ounce. You know what I mean? Like if it sucks, you go back to the dispensary, there's another brand doing a $50 ounce. So you can just play that game for the next fucking four weeks. And one of those might provide the value that you're looking for. You know what I mean? But we all think that like, oh, these fucking kids are going to, it's the same thing with like, like hype beast shit. You know what I mean? Like, oh, we can drop a fucking pair of sneakers every month or every whatever. Like, it's a tough time right now. Not just for the cannabis industry. Like the world is on fire and nobody's got much. So like, I don't know many hype brands that are doing the compar comparable numbers to what they were doing like this time last year. But like cannabis brands, we, we thought that essential wave was forever. We thought that like, oh, we're like, this is here to I stay I think everybody now. did though. Yeah. What happened, I don't think most people are in tune or in touch enough to really even know what happened. But that's because we're navel gazing too much on our own shit and not looking at the bigger world. Well, everyone's just looking at like, their phone all day. Uh, but, but so exactly, right? So we're everyone's looking at their phone. They were investing we're fucking in fucking Robin Hood. They were doing all that shit. But like, that's what I mean, right? Like if you thought, like if you looked around like all the other industries, that's why the fucking market's been tanking the last fucking six months, right? It's because like everything was like artificially inflated to shit. All the numbers are going up it's while the world is on fire. And like, we're all pretending like this is normal. Like I was actually, I, this is like six months into COVID when all the numbers are going up. I called my dad and I was like, should I sell everything right now? Like, this isn't going to last. Like, this isn't, this isn't real. He's like, well, the numbers keep going up. So, you know, you might as well keep it in. The market always wins, you know, don't try and, you know, whatever. I fucking wish that I listened to myself then because I would be sitting way nicer Bro. right now. But, you know, you never know. When, and that's, that's the other thing. Human greed knows no bounds, right? So, like, when kids who are on, in Dogecoin and shit like that, like, oh, Elon Musk is going on fucking Twi on SNL, so it's going to go to a dollar and whatever. Yep. All yep. of the smart money fucking pulled out that fucking night and that it hit 70 so. cents there's a it just old, went up again when he bought twitter that doesn't surprise me yeah, yeah they, they all think that he's Doge gonna take skyrocketed what did it go to uh i think like 600 or six i don't know someone was but yeah it went up it was again. like 12 cents not yeah. 600 no not six, maybe nah, 60 nah, nah, cents or yeah, something yeah, 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 600 yeah. we would have been no, dealing no. with a bunch of i don't know exact kids. numbers but i know it's skyrocketed <laughs> right? yeah well that's no, also that's the funny thing right all those kids same thing happened with nfts like the kids who like didn't cash out and thought they were millionaires now and like went and bought cars and houses and shit like that with like money because and and the thing is, is that at, and even myself at the all time highs, we're, we're going crazy to buy. And then it drops back down to the lows and we're like, so I'm good. This is and it's thing. just this whole ideology of like an investor and then investing in these things is like, That's you have to have emotionally no gear yourself. We also have, pretty much it's like gambling, but we have no, we have no education in terms of yeah. how to properly invest. Like mm -hmm. we, yeah. like investing 101 like if you actually read investing books the first thing they'll tell you is like when you put money into an investment have a fucking exit no like if this if i put this in and this turns to this i'm fucking out and i'm walking or i'm at least pulling out my investment and playing the rest with house money you know what i mean like this way you're playing the green whatever but human greed knows no bounds so when you get on a fucking hot money thing and you think this the number's going up the number's going up you never want to pull out because you're like well the number's going to go higher and i could be fucking i have a thousand dollars now but i might have two thousand dollars tomorrow you know what i mean but again, if you had set your fucking goals and said, this is whatever. But the thing about crypto is these gains are so exponential that it's not actually adjusting against the market. It's just a surge of buyers that are coming in and making it more, you know, more valuable because people are trying or able to get out at higher prices. So like all of this shit, I, I think the reason why a lot, most people made money on crypto this last time around is because they had gotten fucked the last run. And after that shit all crashed, most people didn't sell their holdings. They're just like, fuck it, like, whatever. We'll see if it ever comes back. Like, I was one of those people. Like, I invest, I bought fucking Ethereum when it was like 150 bucks, like fucking super low. And I, I had 10 coins, like, at the time. Um, I did lose a bunch of them on NFTs because, you know, whatever I thought at the moment, a rocket ship, play, you know, whatever. And it was house money at that point, right? Um, it was at like fucking 2,500 bucks. I had bought these things for 150 bucks. In my head, they were still 150 bucks. Cause that's like psychologically, that's what happens, right? Like you paid this one. It's like we were talking about with the fucking ounce prices before, right? Like I grew up paying $400 an ounce for top shelf. So that's what that should be in my head. Anybody who's doing more than that is ripping me off, even though 
the actual market today is saying no, five, six hundred dollars is like common for tops. You know what I mean? Top small batch at least. But again, to every extreme, there's also going to be the people who are doing it for a thousand, twelve hundred dollars. And for some reason, there are still buyers. So like that's the other thing about it is like there's so much clout and hype transference to all this shit that like some people are going to buy shit just because it's the most expensive thing. So like when co- when scarcity comes down to scarcity, scarcity, you know, like but four also pounds of it, of course they can. But is there no ceiling? That's what always baffles me is like, no, no, no. How do you get like, to that number? Well, so my and people is, are still like showing up. It's the audacity, right? You got to have the audacity to be like, this is what my number is. And then like, if no one shows up, you fucking pull it back down. But like, again, like some of these guys, like the reason why they can charge that number here is because the numbers they're getting elsewhere. Like, let's say the UK guys, right? Anybody who's like moving UK work and who's got like, who's got, gets those numbers, that's like 900 pound an ounce, right? Which is when the conversion rate was good, like 13, 1400 bucks an ounce, right? That's how that number got there because they were like, okay, this is what the fucking price is going for over there. So if I can get it for that over there, I can't sell it to you for less because I'm losing money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like, I don't think they're wrong. I actually think that's part of the reason why the UK is so like on it with weed shit is because like they it's too expensive every time they fuck up for them to fuck up too often you know what i mean and like, they'll pay so people will be like yeah I'll fuck i get what now yeah yeah i'll get my best shit over to them like you're, you're getting three times what you get you know or two times what you get you know and then god forbid you can get paid in their their rate you know or their their pound well, now oh, now things have come down i think the euro is like it's like 80 cents or something like that on a dollar which is fucking crazy like i remember when i first started going to europe uh like for spanibus and shit like that it was like uh i think a dollar 50 to a dollar or something like that and i was getting fucking railed on the euro every time i went over there like oh this is only a 300 dollar fucking hotel this ain't so bad you know what i mean and i'm like oh wait 450 is is not what i was expecting um but you know poor kid problems no, oh, dude, that exchange is it's brutal. Interest, it's interesting how the dollar is getting strong, and there's a whole theory behind that too. I think that like we also we're so just ignorant to the rest of the world in the states. Yeah, like, everyone's stuck in their own bubble. We forget how bad That's by shit design, is in my opinion. elsewhere. Well, it's what you can control too. Like I know I can control what's around me. I, I might I, as well live in your own world. Well, and just like this is going to take a lot more work. And like, do you, and like a lot of people, yeah, a lot of like, people don't even go vote or shit like that. Cause they're, it's like, Hey, when it comes down to one vote, then maybe I'll have some proof that my vote would, would count. You know what I mean? But it's like, mm-hmm. it just seems far off. And like, even the voting, it's like, what? Like, I don't know, man. Like there's so much scandal behind it. I think polit- politics is mostly theater to begin with. I think that like, yeah, it's look all at, media. look at this fucking most recent Biden announcement is a great example, right? Like he, it was like, it's not a real announcement. He didn't actually pardon anyone. No one got no one, to no one benefited. To. Um, he's just like, he just made this statement that he thought was going to win him grace during the midterms. That's the whole game of politics, though. It's like, okay, I can't do anything important until my second term. Otherwise, I might not get elected. So what the fuck is your first term about? Yeah. Like, if you're, if you're not doing anything in your first term, you shouldn't have been there in the first place. Shit, you know? he can barely walk to the podium. Man, That's, where are all these guys coming out of Yale, Harvard, coming out of, like, great schools? Can I ask you a question, though? That's what I'm saying, Business man. schools. Guys okay. that are like our genius, like guys that I, are just I like, think about oh, that, I made though. a million dollars by I, the time I, I was 13 it, type shit. I hate to say it, but. Think about that though. Would you, would you do that? If you were that no, fucking we genius guy. It. We need to somehow hook these people into this position. Meaning like. But we tear okay. their lives apart. Like we like, yes. look at how, look at how Joe is getting fucking destroyed after he was like the fucking VP of the. Every the, Everyone's does. favorite VP. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's. That's well, he's the just nature not fit of, for the spot. I'm not, like, I'm not arguing. Physically. I'm 50% not arguing of the people always justified. hate you, no matter what president it is. Like, and that's at least 50, right? Well, it yeah, could I be would more. say it's a rough it, life after that. Look it at comes Trump and back shit. to the. Yeah. He gave up a pretty damn Obama, good life for. Obama was neon gray hair by the time he finished. I don't like, think I mean, that he, he was did, nobody though. before. Like, it made him. It's, 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 it's a rough position. I mean, he was five million dollars. Obama was also the first black president. So that was a whole different set of shit that he had to deal with that yeah, like yeah. i'm not even going to pretend to quantify is similar yeah. to what trump did but i also believe that trump's like riches were largely overstated you know what i mean so like for sure the politics. white house was and really so a way for him to he plug in. into it he definitely definitely was politics are so wacky they're so wacky but i feel like we we're taking a step in the right direction with him because he has a business mindset and we do need a fucking ceo 
to run I totally agree this with you. country. I've been saying we need a Jew for president because we need someone to do our uh, balance man. our checkbook like, for I'm open fucking to anything. Years. As long as they got views, they make decisions, and they're a good leader. I like for that. the greater good of mankind. I like not that. corporations. But that's, that's the big divide. Is that when people think corporate or whatever, it's like yeah, like corporate is the enemy. Only not not per se specifically, but the sense of capitalism through corporations is the enemy because they're the reasons we feel the inflation and the food prices. Why didn't those companies eat the costs for a year, two years? They can, they all can. Well, it's all also come operate the first week that shit comes up. It's they mm-hmm. don't, it gets passed right to the consumer and the consumer has no power. And I think that that's what's being manipulated a bit. Huh? Do you see the thing about flight prices? How like flight prices year over year have raised like I think it's forty nine percent or something it's insane, like that. Right, it's and crazy. Every single airline made record profits this yeah. year. So if everything is so bad and they can't make money, why are they making record profits? Like it's but so that's also like the it's the, the same thing with fuel and oil. The thing yeah. that I think is important. The fuck is going on for the it's cannabis all triple industry? Now? Record profits too. Record profits. So this oh, is what I mean. We got to make back what we lost over COVID. It's like why we this all is, lost. Oh, so you're oh we paid. We didn't oh. use it. This is what yeah, I mean. No, yeah, like, but no, but they're like, well, now we got to make it back. We yeah. we six dollars a gallon now. Because that's why I say capitalism through corporations is no and you're not the bullshit i don't think you're wrong but i think that's actually the the reason and paying more attention to this and how the rest of the world is operating in ways that don't make sense will help inform us why the shit that's happening around us doesn't make sense because you don't have to be profitable in business anymore for the last 20 years apparently to stay in business like that's a fucking wild concept you can just two of the biggest companies and i'm just pulling these out of my ass because i know these for a fact but netflix and uber institutions most of us use every single day cannot figure out how to be profitable and they stay in business they continue to get bailed out and raise money and shit like that so like for us to assume Too that to bad fail. business practices is enough to put you out of business in today's world is like not really paying attention to modern game it's also the same way that i think like and this, I, I say this about marketing a lot i think that there's a lot of like old math applied to marketing that like made sense when we weren't in such a connected world. Like the idea that like Nike should only produce like a, a limited number of the shoes that everybody wants. Like they actually don't get to eat off that because the aftermarket's who absorbs all that fucking cost. So companies like StockX and, whatever, and Grailed or whatever are able to make a business and that's great for them. But if Nike just made enough of the fucking Jordans to satisfy all the people that wanted them and less of the ones that were fucking bullshit or whatever, they would actually sell more sneakers. Mm -hmm. But instead, there's this mentality that like we need to keep up the demand so we can't sell all of them or whatever. But the people that want them are spending more money. You are losing sometimes double, triple, quadruple the the, the cost of whatever said item is to an aftermarket that is being lecherous off of the consumerism. You know what I mean? Instead of just creating, and this is what I actually say for actually for the retail, the retailers in cannabis a lot. It blows my mind that most cannabis retailers haven't figured out how to make money because like, honestly, it should just be a fucking, what's it called? A inventory management game. Like if you have any concept of how this shit works again, and I understand there might need to be terms for certain things, whatever, especially when people are getting set up. I'm not saying it's a perfect world where like everyone's going to pay cash on demand. That would be great, but like there's not enough margin in it right now where that's happening for everybody. You know what I mean? Um, that said, I think that like if people actually paid more attention to how like the rest of the shit was working and how like, you know, watching that the farmers weren't making money and stop trying to necessarily t- mark everything up 100% just to whatever and work with the people who they can actually develop long term relationships with, it would be a much more harmonious and I don't want to say even friendly, but like, nice place to work but instead everyone thinks that everyone's out to get them and every retailer is trying to go vertical to maximize all their profits so they fuck all the brands that are in the store like it's it's designed to work against itself so that the guys who don't give a shit who could just run the money out will watch us all fucking burn ourselves out ruin our fucking be ruin our time and then fucking exit to the door man this is so true people People, anyone that thinks this isn't so true, man, one of the biggest battles, like you're, you're literally singing the praise, bro, is that we, we would have these dispensaries and dealing with them was absolute nightmare. And now it's gotten even worse with some dispensaries where they're so detached from the real market. They don't build relationships anymore with buyers. Like back in the day, you would drive an hour to uh, a Green Wolf, a Buds and Roses. Uh, oh, they got the Kyle Cushman GDP. 
well, that was very specific because they built that relationship with him. And yep. like they, they, and, and then vice versa with Green Wolf with like Turpogs and Skittles crew. You knew if you went to Green Wolf for a while, they, oh, they got the real shit. Yep. There ain't no play. There ain't no vittles, right? This is like the real. There ain't no vittles. And, and it just like, now there's places where like, well, we like I heard the other day I'm having this combo. It's like, oh, we marked you up 200 percent on some products, 200 percent on like the little can then and the taxes and everything. Yeah, else, yeah. You know but well, they say it's a third. So so the, the farmer who spent three months growth gets twenty dollars. Right. Then 20 goes to the shop and then 20 goes to the state. But so this taxes are out of control. The thing too. that everyone forgets, though, is like that. That's not. and that, OK, so this is another piece that I wrote for weirdos mm -hmm. and like. Maybe I should step back when I I've referenced weirdos a few times. No, people need to know about it if it's this dope. The reason why we created it was because, again, like I, I'm trying to use high times to only spread light, right? And like, and uplift everybody. But there are things that we need to say that like are not the nicest that are like trying to course correct where things are going, right? And so I wrote a piece, Where Does the Money Go? Because when uh, we had uh, Dante Jordan uh, wrote a piece a few months before for us about stop complaining about the price. And a lot of the response to that was people being like, oh, well, who said it should be $60 an eighth and whatever. So I reverse engineered the whatever because I wanted to show people like, even if it is $20 that's going back to that fucking farmer, it might cost them $12 an eighth to produce. You know what I mean? So if they're only making three to seven bucks, that's not a crazy amount of fucking money for them to profit off of all of this work they're doing to bring stuff to you, right? So again, the, the point of weirdos is more for us to like get on soapbox. And actually, just so you guys know, if you ever have something that you'd want to say like that, we'd love to have you. Um, but it really is an opportunity for us to not necessarily throw punches, but to try and course correct where things are headed because to the point about THC percentage, we're losing some of the most exciting phenos because they're low testers. Like we're cutting off our nose to spite our face, literally. You know what I mean? And like, it's it's unfortunate, but like you also can't blame the, and this is actually the same thing I feel about uh, terpene percentages, right? Like, yes, we should have terpene percentages on every package that goes out, but like the state's not requiring it. So how is it fair to add on another expense to a, the business owners who are already completely overburdened with taxes and things like that? What really needs to happen is we need the government to make the change and say, no, this is now the new standard, right? Like we're, they're fucking doing it in Vegas. Like it's not like it's not possible, but like, again, they, the bureaucrats thought THC percentage is the, is the fucking potency measure. It's just like proof, right? Like, meanwhile, like, do you, do you know the story about proof? You know where proof comes from for alcohol? No, talk about it a little bit. Okay. So in the bootlegging days, mm -hmm. back uh, when somebody would like sell liquor when, the, when it wasn't allowed, they would break open a barrel, pour some on the bar. And if they could light it on fire, that was proof that it had, that was, you know, strong alcohol. In order for something to light on fire, it needs to be 50% alcohol, which would be a hundred percent proof. So the proof is a 200 scale because anything over a hundred, uh, over 50% alcohol lights on fire. And that's a hundred percent proof that it's good alcohol. And then some things like 151 is whatever that translates to in percentage, right? So that was really a, a metric of potency. You know what I mean? THC percentage is like saying like, oh, I want to measure how good this fucking chicken Parmesan is by how much fucking marinara sauce you used. Like that's one metric. And like that could have something to do with whether or not it's a good fucking chicken parm. But like if all that you care about is that one thing, you're missing two of the most important pieces of the whatever. And that's what is like largely happening with terpenes. And we're also not educating the, because this is another, you know, throw out some elbows, talk some shit. Um, the Indica and Sativa conversation. We're just, we're continuous, continuing to mislead new consumers that we're like supposed to be educating and then wondering why nobody knows shit about what they're buying. Like, because you've been fed a bunch, of, like we still tell people 70, this is a 70, 30 Indica Sativa split. Like says who? Show me the science that explains that this is a 70-30. Th there is none. It's just some guy arbitrarily smoked it. And be like, oh, this makes me, you know, yeah. a little bit more up than down. You, you go in the shop, they're like, oh, do you like indicas or sativas? And I'm just like, I, good weed. When I think about it, it's like, it's all hybrids right now. Mm -hmm. Like, everything's a hybrid. Mm -hmm. It's what all hybrid, but about? also cannabis sativa is legal. It's hemp. It's what fucking, it's what the farm bill is about, right? So if you go and look at the farm bill, like, they actually legalized cannabis sativa. Cannabis indica, the one that has all the THC that we've hybrid, hybridized, whatever, the one that everyone wants, that's still outlawed, right? So like, again, like we're using 
this these misnomers because we want to sound scientific and smart and like instead we're just continuing to mislead and push the conversation in the wrong direction so actually another piece that i have coming for weirdo specifically jimmy divine did a piece for us uh who's one of my favorite journalists in the space um about it indica and steve are bullshit and it's he he proposed that uh afghani and equatorial are better names um I'm writing a rebuttal to it, which is basically like, I think we need to say upper and downer because I think that that's like very simply what people are usually trying to communicate. Like this wakes me up versus this, you know, knocks me out. Um, but again, like we need to figure out and that the point of part of what we want to do with weirdos is like have these conversations in real time in front of the audience so that not only can they be a part of it and join in and be like, oh, maybe this, you know what I mean? But also so that like, because we don't have a clear answer, you know what I mean? There's not a, hey, this is exactly what we should do. And instead of trying to be like, like Leafly did that thing with um, the Terp guide or whatever. And like said, like, this is the, uh, like, these are cake strains and these are fruit strains. I don't even remember what it was, but like trying to like ter- create a Terp classification system. I don't think we're even we're even far enough into understanding terpenes where like that should be what we're focusing on because we're trying to quantify and use more bro science for something that we don't fully understand, you know? So it's like it, again, it's an evolving game especially being high times like one of the things that I'm trying to <laughs> keep in mind is like we posted a lot or we wrote in the magazine like a lot of shit back in the day that wasn't necessarily the best medical advice right like there were things like when we were talking about other drugs back in the day like these say like things like benzos aren't addictive they are they're very addictive and like you know that was the science that was available at that time so i do try and keep in mind that like where we are today is not like let's like if you wrote about fucking the poop soup uh concentrates we had fucking 10 years ago and like those people were like oh i'm never gonna do concentrates again because i saw that trash like okay, that's, you know, that was trash. I'm not arguing that with you, but like you're missing out on a whole world of opportunity because you had one bad experience, which actually I do think is a lot of people's experience with cannabis. Most of the people who don't consume, it's like usually like, oh, I had an edible and I had a bad time or something like that. Not like no one's usually indifferent to cannabis. You know what I mean? At least Mm -hmm. in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I I mean, and I also think like with cannabis, it's, it's a little like alcohol, but it's also a little like other things. It's also a little like pharmaceutical. It has different properties. So it's not just, everyone wants to just put it in a category. It's like this. No, it's. What do you think about if they reschedule it into the same classes? The thing that worries me is this, whenever the government gets more involved, it gets wackier and crazier and more expensive and shittier and harder to do and takes longer. They never get in and be like, let me streamline this. That never happens. So mm-hmm. like the big scare with federal legalization is with, oh, you want to pay another tax now? And now they're going to want a good amount of money and they're going to make it even more regulated. They're going to try to figure out how to get their hand in it and make their own. It's the same with the state is that it's weird to me that like we pass these laws and then a couple here and there get reformed. But it's like, why aren't they sitting down every six months or every quarter with growers, extraction people, dispensary owners. How do we figure this out? How do we get better? How do like, so you realize this is your job. That's the reason that we're in this fucking world on fire existence we live in is because it's compounded problems. It's like all of these things that this is just the way it's done. This is just, yeah, this is, they just wrote it like this, but this is written for how it was 50 years ago before it was, you know, before we were in a connected, everyone could talk to a million people world. Um, and again, like, especially bureaucracy doesn't like to change. You mm. know what I mean? It's just, this is the way it was done thing. This is how, what I get paid for, whatever. I actually thought that federal legalization was waiting for one of the states to like figure it out. Right. That's what I thought was happening. It was like, they Me were too. like, when Everyone one thought of Colorado them. Colorado would be the one. And then Colorado yeah, yeah. was the first golden child, um, which it was surprising. I'm amazed that it took California this long to legalize, but also like I, now that it happened, like I also understand what the hesitation was. You know what I mean? Like, cause to me, I'm always of the, you got to play the game to win the game mentality. Like the game might suck. The hand you dealt might suck. But like, if you don't play against it, you, you can't be pissed off about the position you're in. You know what I mean? Um, a lot of, I don't think a lot of people look at things like that. I think a lot of people prefer to look at like, oh, prefer to say, poor me, like the world didn't shake out the way I expected it to. So like, this is just the way things are right now. And the reality is like, you can change a lot. 
You know what I mean? Like you can get pretty far. Listen, cannabis has been legalized in our lifetime. You know what I mean? Things are definitely moving. But like, I think the thing that like a lot of us forget is there's a lot of work to get there. And a lot of us like to be loud and talk about it and say, you know, like whatever, but not very many of us do the work. It's actually, okay, so this is, this is a polarizing opinion. There are a lot of people who have, and I don't think anybody's wrong in having this feeling, right? But there are a lot of people who want to have feelings about Kyle from Glasshouse, right? And whether or not he should be allowed to be in the industry because he's a former police officer. And now to me, I think the ego of that question and, and saying I should have some judgment over whether or not other people can participate in an industry that I want to participate in is just the wrong mentality to have. It's up to the I, consumer. I, it, it's up to the consumer, mm -hmm. but it's also like, it's just not, it's some other individual's play. It has nothing to do with me, right? And we can be mad about it and you can not choose not to do business with those pers those people. But like, I don't necessarily think that it's my place to say, no, this person can't participate, right? It's the same thing with Ligandra Astrandra. It's, it's cannabis is supposed to be inclusive, not exclusive. We're supposed to let people, oh, you want to like, you, you want to be part of this? Oh man, what's up? Not, oh, you can't sit with us. Well, but hold on. So to that same point, Kyle is doing much more work today to get people out of prison than most of the people who are talking shit about him being a former police officer. Mm. Now, I definitely believe that he has restitution that he needs to make up for the damage that he helped cause. And that's part of the reason why he's doing those things. But it's really, really frustrating to hear people who aren't doing anything to get all of these people who are still in prison, whatever, who are very loud on social and saying, oh, like this guy shouldn't be able to participate and this guy shouldn't be able to participate when they're not doing anything but trying to participate themselves. They're just trying to say, I'm better than this person for whatever fucking reason. And that like to me is like talking just to talk it's well it's it's your ego talking you're mm -hmm. showing the world that you're you're scared or upset about this thing right because if you weren't if you were like busy people don't have time to fucking navel gaze on everyone else's decisions they focus on like and listen i i said this yesterday when i posted about um the emerald cup but like i second guess every fucking thing i do but my job is to put things out there into the world you know what i mean so like i kind constantly want to make sure that we are, the steel is as sharp as possible. You know what I mean? Other people have, has other people's gigs are different steel, right? So if your steel is fucking hawking flour, right? If your flour isn't the best shit in the world, which it, let's be real, is like a fucking very ego driven title to begin with. And like, you're almost never going to be that. So if that's what you're striving for, like you're destined to be upset. Um, but if you're not constantly trying to make your flour better, like it doesn't matter what anyone else is doing because like you're not the contender for that spot that you want to be. So until your shit is so fire and like you look at people like Greasy, right? Like Greasy is really loud at like when he like, you know, about other people's weed and stuff like that. But he actually is growing some really good fire. You know what I mean? So like to me, when you have, when you can actually deliver something that people consider a premium product, it does build you more opportunity to actually comment on said things. And I'm, I recognize I'm saying this as a commentator, as someone who's like outside of the industry, but also the reason why I'm never going to talk shit about somebody's weed is because I can't grow any better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like your shit is not whatever I grow. Like I don't have a green thumb. That is not my skill set, Right. So like, I don't want to pretend that whatever my thought is of how you should be making your plants better or how you can improve your numbers or whatever, like is not any more valuable than yours is. You know what I mean? Well, but yeah, but if you try a beer and it's bitter, it tastes like shit to you. It's well, a but bitter, shitty beer. 100%. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, yeah, this stuff. I mean, it's somewhat subjective, but there is a line in the sand. I feel, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and listen, I'm not saying that you can't have opinions. And like, also like, I yeah. think that I actually created in the shit talking piece, I created like a, a rules of engagement thing to specifically say like, you know, if someone comes at you or like you get ripped off by a brand or something like that, like to some degree, like, I think that's a community service is like warning people like, Hey, don't fuck with this person. Now I'm never going to use that, do that under high times brand, but on my own page, like absolutely all the time, I'll be like, Oh, this, this person's a fuck. This brand is a fuck. Don't work with these people, you know, whatever, because I want my community to, to be safe. You know what I mean? Now, 
that said, I might, I might not do that all publicly. You know what I mean? Like also if like there's plenty of sketchy people in the industry that like I like if I see one of my friends working with, I'll call them on the side. And that's also obviously a difficult, I think we said this before, but it's like telling someone their girlfriend sucks. Like you got to be very careful when you like see some, you're interfering with somebody's business relationships. You know what I mean? Like I'm not ever trying to take money out of somebody's pocket. But I also want you to know if like maybe you shouldn't get too far out with somebody. You know what I mean? So I think that's like walking that line and figuring out how to like look out for people without necessarily shit talking is important. But I think that like, again, like there are people who are qual actually qualified to like comment on certain things. And then there's like the rest of the market who like just wants to be a contender so bad that they think some hot take against whoever the current king is, is going to like win them a crown. You know what I mean? And so like, again, I say I bring up Kyle because I don't necessarily think that like, again, I think he's got his own, he's got his own business that he needs to like justify with your get right with himself in order to participate here. Right. But I definitely think that a lot of people who have never done anything to get anyone out of prison, like, maybe shouldn't be talking about the one or one of the few guys in the industry who like is actively at every opportunity talking about, Hey, let's get these guys out of jail, you know? And like, it's, it's more just a conversation of, Oh, I just don't like that guy. And I don't think he should participate as opposed to like, you know, maybe somebody who you don't like is doing something that's beneficial to us all, you know? And that's, that's a big part of how we get to the next level is like, we got to deal with a lot of people who we don't like, who we wouldn't f just hang out with it's in tough, order. Man. That's a tough combo though. And it, well, and with, that's, when, it, when it goes to cops and detectives, be a combo. Well, so it 100%. depends on how you've been affected. Cause a lot of these people, mm -hmm. you got to understand their family's been taken away. Well, and let's be very clear. All by, and they've been stem. mistreated. Let's be very know? clear. So I'm not justifying it's, it's working a, it's with these people. It's a tough one. I've thought yeah, yeah. about this. I see both sides. I, I 100% do too. And it's like too. specific. No, no, I see. It's like talk, it's hard to generally talk about this as so, a topic, you know. You get to vote with your feel dollars. Like, exactly. Almost feel like we need to have them on the show. Exactly. Honestly, oh, we need to get to that and like it. you. The best thing you can always do is like they always say like vote with your dollars, but it's so true. Like if you don't fuck with it, don't fuck with it. Exactly. And like it's one thing to that's like, you're right. Yeah, a hundred percent. You reserve that right. And that's the thing that I think that this this is the point, right? Is that like I'm not saying do business with dude. I'm not mm -hmm. saying he's a good dude. I'm not saying that I think that he deserves to be here. I'm saying simply, I think anybody who dictates who else can be in right. the industry is Make a sure gatekeeper. You're a real player Where if you're going to have You're, you're yeah. a gatekeeper with the wrong mentality if you're trying to do that, number one. But number two, like I, I really think that like every, every industry, every great thing is made up of people from all different walks of life. And the only way we're going to get to the next level, like... I don't like cops. I don't want to be friends with cops. I don't want to know cops, but I'm going to need to have some conversations with cops so that they understand that every t everybody who's getting stoned isn't fucking out to like fucking, you know, rape their women and fucking and ruin their birthday party or some bullshit yeah, like bad that. Things, you know yeah. what I mean? And Not so bad like people, that's the, th that's the problem with politics, right? Nobody wants to reach across the aisle and like, that's, that's in my opinion, the most important shit that we can do as like, again, like I said before, like I came into high times very much aware of like the relationship that people had with, there's some people had with the brand, right? And like, to me, going back to those people and being like, I appreciate that you have a problem and I want to talk to you about it and understand what happened and see how we can move forward. Like that is hard to do for a lot of people, right? Nobody wants to fall on the sword. But what I will say is that I learned at my agency job falling on the sword doesn't hurt at all. And like whoever you fell for will never fucking forget it. So like for me, when I was the agency guy and like, I like for clients, I just get in front of something like, Oh, whoops, that was my bad. I was supposed to do that. I dropped the ball, like whatever in front of their clients. I was never the one who was supposed to do whatever what came up, but I made them look better. I, I looked like the incompetent fucking, uh, what's it called consultant. So they didn't look bad. And all of a sudden that person like forever is going to remember like, Oh, you looked out for me when I fucking, you know, when I fucked up. I used to do that with homies and their girls. I'd be like, yo, just tell them you were kicking it with me. Cause like the homies would be like, oh man, my girl's tripping. I was supposed to be, I'm like, yeah, yeah, just blame it on me. Not even that. How many times have you played fake boyfriend? You're smoking and hanging out. How many times have you played fake boyfriend at the no. bar for one of your fucking girlfriends or whatever, who like some dude was hitting on and like, you were like, oh yeah, no, she's with me. You know what I mean? <laughs> like bullshit like that. Like you gotta, you gotta play the game. But I think that like, 
You can't let the game play you. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, bro. I'll say, I'll, I'll, I say this about rich kids a lot, but like, I never had a problem taking money from rich kids, right? Like, the problem is when the rich kid starts telling you how shit's going to go. Like, if you just want the dank, I can provide that. I can provide it at a nice price for your standards. You know what I mean? That said, if you start telling me, oh, you can get it from this person at this price or whatever, okay, good. So go get it from fucking that person at that price. You know what I mean? But if the rich kid's just like, oh, I want the best and I want whatever, like, so the point about the kids who are paying $1,200 for ounces, can you really blame the person taking advantage of that opportunity? Or is it just a person who sees a, a, a hole in the market and is looking to fill it? You know what I mean? Like to me, mm. they're taking advantage. I, my, but, my, my opinion on this is yeah, that, that if I pay for it and it's the most I paid, it needs to blow my mind. It oh, needs I at least be an experience that I'll never forget. And that hasn't happened for me with I weed. 800 with plus on a zip hasn't happened yet. Um, I smoke four hundred, five hundred dollar ounces. Yep, this definitely is going to be definitely happens. Fire, mm -hmm. you know. This like is going to be the most polarizing Something thing I probably that say you here. Put out, and you're like, I'm going to smoke this whole jar probably tonight, and just because I'm enjoying and I'm loving it. Whereas these sixteen hundred dollar ounces and shit, and I've bought mainly, I'd say most of them. Not one if I went back for it and been like, I need more of that. Because you just set, to put it, you know, you set a bar and that's because you're an actual connoisseur, right? So that value conversation, I don't know if we talked about this on the podcast yet, but we haven't gotten to the value conversation of like cannabis and what is actually worth like a $60 eighth, right? Because the consumers are just used to seeing that price point. They're not used to saying this is, or they're not even under like, in a, I don't want to say intellectual, but under, they don't understand the product enough to be able to say, this is the value for this, right? It's, it's very difficult. The bar is set so high when the price is something like $1,200 or $1,600 that to me, and again, this is what I was going to say, it's super polarizing. Weed only gets so good. You know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. I love weed. It's my favorite fucking thing in the world. But like no weed that I have ever seen is worth its weight in gold. You know what I mean? And like that's really where a lot of this shit is going right now is like, how much can we push it? How much can we whatever? And there's a market of kids who just want the most expensive shit, regardless of what it is. Not only do they not have the ability to actively grade it, but they don't have, they're dealing with money that like is past our comprehension. You know what I mean? Like, again, for me, as somebody who like used to buy a hundred dollar ounces because like, oh, boom, I could fucking get an ounce for a hundred bucks. Like, look at the value there. You know what I mean? And also, I should say when I first got to Los Angeles, I never went to the same dispensary for the first like six, maybe 12 months I was out here. So I was just going and using, doing all the first time patient shit. Right. So I was going from dispensary to dispensary, like, oh, you can get a free gram if you do this, if you do that, whatever. So I think like expecting loyalty in a lot of these consumers is something that like you're thinking of it to CPG and not like, oh, these consumers are taking advantage of the opportunity that's in front of them. Most of us that are long term consumers are not used to shopping in stores. We're used to getting whatever was fucking available. So why wouldn't that mentality move to the next level? And it is just what's available at that, that store as opposed to most people are not lurking out specific brands anymore. The people that are saying, hey, I'm going to this store because they have this brand, that is the high level consumer. The lower level consumer is still shopping by price point and like, Listen, there's a lot of value in a hundred in an ounce for you know a hundred bucks for someone that only smokes a gram fucking maybe for three three sessions. You know what I mean? Um, my brother, for example, I sent him uh what was it? Heisman. So he's a, he's really into sports. So I send him anytime I get some of the athlete shit, I like, you know, I send it back his way. And uh maybe it was a Jeter collab or something like that, but they had those infused minis. And he has smoked that infused mini probably six times. Like he, one little mini. He, he takes like two hits from it and it fucking rocks his world into another dimension. He can like put it out and like fucking, you know, smoke it again in the next sesh. And like, obviously that's a very foreign concept for me, right? But like, that's, a, that's the majority of the new school consumer. So as we think about like, what's important and to like, you know, the next generation and, and to the, the new consumer, the new people that are coming. That's to what it is. These grows where it starts shutting down. Oh, Lord. Oh, if Jeter, I mean, if, if uh, infused pre-roll with Keith on the outside with some crazy diamonds on the, yeah, 
If that's in the, uh, and that's I mean, where that's I, why you put it out. Look at the market. There's a disconnect. Look at the market. Bet, though. Listen, here's my here's my argument. I bet if I put a joint in front of him of some original Z fire indoor Skittles, he would keep hitting it and be like, "Holy shit!" He would want to keep hitting it. I agree. Even past the point of comfortability, where he'd still be like, "I'm high as shit," but man, something about mm-hmm. this fucking weed, I keep wanting to smoke it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so, something to that, though, think, right? Where it's like you taste, you, you you light it up, it's like popping in your face. It's black. You're like, uh, and you put it out in one hit and you're like ooh, i'm fucked up like yeah of course like you're, most consumer hasn't had that experience though you know what i mean like that's the a connoisseur thing. experience this is you're actually, talking about we were talking about this before about like brands that are going to new york that have kind of like are less popular today than they were at you know their peak out here and are trying to think that new york won't pick up any on new that state stuff. yeah exactly but any new state that's popping well new york i say specifically just yeah. because the trap is like alive there in a way that like you don't see in very many st- like or as visible as you don't see in many other states um but there's a there's an understanding with consumers that actually want to smoke the best right and then there are people who like just like there's a like Budweiser is a gig, has a gigantic base. Like there are plenty of people who just will get the standard like whatever pre roll pack the comp the uh, store has because they don't know how to roll a joint. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. And I, I, th- I think I could see that in the foreseeable future where it opens up more and you can get it at places like gas stations and shit. And it comes down to like that's coming. That, yes. Whether comes or not out we like minimal it. brands, well known, same thing as like Bud Light, Michelob Ultra, like all that type of shit, right? You got your what eight shelves in the beer, you know, maybe three, four coolers. But then think like four fifty north, or is it four oh five north? Four oh five brewing, four, yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So like those guys, like that's a very regional brand, right? But they made waves nationally because their shit got so hyphy. And like that's, in my opinion, that's where the market is going to go, where there's going to be like these fucking like Apples and fucking Googles and like whatever of the market. And then there's going to be like, it's also why I don't think the trap is going anywhere because like, and I, I think I started to say this before, but if shit goes um, to pharma, right? To me, what that means is like, you got a bunch of good paydays for a lot of the guys that have been doing it well. And then they just go and start something new in the trap. And then it's back to the old days. You know what I mean? Because like, again, the real quality is not going to happen at that scale because the money guys don't want the margins for that. They're not going to spend extra fucking on a couple extra days on flowering if they can get it down uh, quicker and fucking out the door faster. You know what I mean? It basically goes against what he was explaining where it's like, you are on the plan schedule and they're like, no, we're not. They're on our schedule. Yes. And it just doesn't work like that. Why do you think sativas? Where why do you think there are less sativas? It's like the, the obvious example is like when you have a baby, you're on the baby's schedule. Yep. The baby's not on your schedule. Oh, you're sleeping at midnight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'll wake up at 8 a.m. So you better not say shit. Like, can you it's imagine thinking that? Yeah, yeah it's it's a baby. What I'm saying. And it's, it's and that is always a baby or a teen. Yeah. Don't get past teen, even a mature adult. It's yeah. that's a teen that's getting mature. Yeah. You know, it's and my, my, let me tell you my theory about this. The reason we're getting $1,600 ounces and $1,200 ounces, we're seeing that. It's the same reason we're seeing four pounds of light, three pounds of light. We're seeing overproduction. There's so much to swim through. When you see something that's gold, you're like, fuck, what's that worth? I just had to swim three miles through bullshit Look, it's a to get here. It's oh, a that's $1,300? We'll take it. Because if not, I got to buy another 28th to try to find something that's smokable. Oh, everyone's saying this is smokable? Oh, I'll take that. I've... I've- I've definitely went to the dispensary so many times and come out and like 10 ace, maybe mm-hmm. one, one, yep. maybe it's a, so it's supply and demand, right? I mean, everyone, and this is also what happens when everyone and their brother gets into the fucking game. Like we're all surprised that like the prices drop because there's so much bullshit on the market. If the beers didn't control the diamond market, they wouldn't be worth shit either. Mm-hmm. It's just fucking glass, right? Like, but they, have a fucking vault of them that they never let out and they fucking buy them all for fucking pennies in the dollar. And they tell us this is what it's fucking worth. It's like an iPhone, right? Like, but instead like, and actually, no, this That's is a it, good analogy. It's exactly That's like a great iPhone. analogy. The iPhone is the one that everyone wants because it's fucking dank and shit like that. And now the consumers at the bottom, like this, is this is the difference is our premium is not readily available because of how low or how few numbers it is or how, how low the quantity is of what's mm-hmm. available, right? 
So everyone wants the iPhone because everyone knows the rich guys have the iPhone and like that's the best phone and that's the, you know, whatever. And then they got the guys who are on Android who either want to be different or want more functionality or want whatever, but there's a gazillion different Android brands, right? And there's only the one Apple iPhone, right? So what is going to happen, and I don't necessarily mean this in like there's going to be one Apple or whatever, but there's going to be, that. that's why people like flock to these brands, right? Is they find their thing that they think is the Apple of the space and then they kind of stop looking. And that's, I think, the thing that like, think the thing that like we don't really know how to quantify yet is consumers, again, once they find the value that they're used to feeling because they're used to feeling like, oh, was that really worth $60 an eighth, whatever? Once they find that value, they stick with it, at least initially, because they want to make sure that they're still getting the, the same bang for their buck, mm. right? And like, again, that's the reason why the traditional market is so, in my opinion, remains king is because like, if you fuck up on a pack that you sell to somebody, like that person's going to make you feel it. Either he's oh, going to yeah. say something next time or he's not going to come back to you or like whatever, um, or he's going to try and just get money back or whatever. Um, the recreational market doesn't have to deal with that. They don't have fucking returns in 90% of the situation. They don't know if the consumer is not coming back. And also they're used to the consumer not coming back because there's a gazillion fucking stores. So why would a consumer shop? The, why would, how good does the value have to be for that person to return to your store? And I think that part of the conversation that we haven't, I want to write this really badly, but obviously high time zone dispensaries. So I don't know uh, how, uh, if I, if this one's going to get passed, but to me, dispensaries are the modern record store. Even if done perfectly, we're working on a very limited window of feasibility. Go direct to consumer. Direct to consumer is the well, way. That even makes seven, sense. Labs even right now. even yeah. I'm, I'm, besides that, I would pray and bank on the federal play is to allow a go to go direct to consumer well, so, and oh. interstate. But and think about it like, like this. Breweries. Open it up like breweries. You look at companies like Dutchie, right? That's like the way Dutchie's they worth re retrieve the most dollars, honestly. Yes. Just open it the fuck but up. But we're all, we're building for this small niche community that we live in and like companies like Dutchie, which are now worth like $4 billion or whatever, right? Why are they not redundant the day that Shopify is interested in getting into this game? The answer is they are. They just, because they don't want, these guys don't want to pay attention. Why are, do, and does any del delivery service matter once Uber Eats and fucking Amazon say, hey, we're going to start shipping this shit? Like, I think Uber started in Canada. They did. They did just made it an announcement. I don't think it started yet, but they did just make an announcement. We'll start that they're working start on doing it. it. Can you imagine yeah. I'll take a quarter and some cheese fries and a soda. Like, you can literally, that's, already, already, that's, already why, that's crazy. But the infrastructure that exists. On, yeah, in DoorDash, any of these apps now, you can have them go to Walgreens for wow. you on the way. You can have them go to the grocery store. I mean, you can bundle it all into one. The AI is running this shit. Like, yeah. like we have people trying to solve these problems, but like, you don't have the hundreds of millions they've spent on AI and the people to make it work. Yep. You know, the user experience is like the most that's underrated. That's why they can run at a negative loss. And that's what answers because they control the market and it's too big to fail. So, I mean, mm. listen, I think that like to some degree, yes, they control the market, but I, I do think that like, it's very clear. Like there's a reason why Amazon still has to follow the trends and make their basics based on what people are shopping after. You know what I mean? Like it's still, it's still to some degree reactionary. And then they try and plan and like, so actually, do you ever hear the Amazon dot? Do you remember when they did that? That like button you could press when like, so it was, if you had a prime membership, you could, they would like sell you, or I think they were free, but like, it was like a button that you could push in your house. that said like downy on it or fucking, uh, you know, detergent or fucking whatever. And anytime you're running out, you can hit it and it would automatically fucking send an order or whatever. So you could put it in your cabinet and like when you're running low on paper towels or running low on detergent or something like that, you just hit the fucking button. Now that's cool because like it just like, you know, it, it makes everything much more on demand and whatever. And obviously you still got to wait for the shipping process, whatever. But what that actually was in a great show was data harvesting. And now they understand, okay, you need new toilet paper every two weeks or something like that. And that works against for advertising where now they can go to, let's say you normally shop with Downey. They can go to Bounty and be like, yo, we know this guy who normally spends this much every month. How much would you pay to get in front of him as a potential consumer? And now they like have more lucrative ads because they know about you and they can dial in the experience more, right? So like, again, are we, 
we talk about damn corporations and damn, you know, whatever, but that's how that shit happens. Like you are now able to see, like, look at, look at Instagram. Instagram is a great example. I don't know if you guys get a ton of ads or if you're even spending a lot of time on it, but the yep. ads on Instagram fucking crush it for me. They are always like, I spent so much money on stupid bullshit off Instagram because everything they show me is something that I love. That's, uh, that's from Matt understanding at scale what people like and you look like this person who liked this thing. So they fucking let's serve it to you and see what you feel. That's like, that's where everything is headed. Like the world is headed, right? Like eventually, hopefully like, and I don't want to say AI takes everyone's jobs or whatever, but wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to work anymore because they were just fucking machines that could fucking handle everything, right? But no. like- Hell no. Because <laughs> no. if you can't offer any value, then, you know, plan on being, uh, you know, just a, just a, a so, glob. I mean, just walking around, just nothing. So you want to get really deep? I actually think that- that is when society will fully evolve because until we can stop navel gazing on all of our own individual bullshit and think about things collectively as a society and what's best for everyone and not just best for our individual think about like think about the coal industry right the whole industry knows it's fucking disaster for climate it, it's not it doesn't hide from this but this is what generations of people have been doing. They know what killed their fucking grandpas and fucking fathers and they still want those fucking jobs that's their own like individual experience driving this decision that is, you know, detrimental for the rest of us. But like, again, look at the oil and white cars are, don't run on hemp oil is because fucking gas is a renewable is a fucking not a renewable is a, uh, commodity, a limited resource so they can charge more money for it. All of these things didn't happen by accident. You know what I mean? But like to some degree, if we don't look at why these decisions were made and think about like how things are happening at, at a deeper level, we can't really understand where we are. You know what I mean? And I think that like, that's what really needs to happen. We need to be having deeper conversations and just like, oh, this is how my life experience has presented. You know what I mean? And more about like, okay, no, this is what we need to do collectively. So let's all work towards X, Y, and Z as opposed to like, you know, we're having war in this country because we don't like where this line is drawn. You know what I mean? Like, like, like listen, there's, I don't know. Do you guys hear the fucking shit that happened with North Korea last night? Yeah. They shot a missile over like into a, the sea. A bunch of missiles. Yeah. It's apparently. crazy. Yeah, but this is also parallels cannabis. Like have the discussion, help move the needle. Like it's everything. And, and, and like, I want to bring this up because I've seen this so much and this has been a topic of like four convos I've had in the last week is that like the cannabis industry, when we first came up, everything that, product wise that was like brought to you was like this will make your weed better this will keep your weed better this will store it better this will now it's not that everything the lights the nutrients you will get more you will grow it cheaper it's like food. it's way cheaper it's, it's way more they're shit playing the margin but game. nobody not one product i can even think of in the past five four or five years out there lighting i mean lighting nutrients uh even like in your we used to buy these things that spin and supposedly it creates a magnetic field in the, in the room. Right. And your plants grow better weed, but that's what sold it. None of that right now, all the research is being done in, you can grow it for less and you can grow way more of it. Let's overproduce these buds. So they have low to, you know, and then let's load them up. So they taste like nothing with the cheapest nutrients you can. So let's just strip it out. And it's, it's this on and on thing of like, it's just another thing, but right? that's it's like a commodity. That's how capitalism works, right? It's like, we need to slim these margins or we need to grow these margins as much as possible. So how can we drive the price of the cost of everything as far to the ground as possible? How can we maximize all of our production? You know what I mean? And like, unfortunately, this is the way everything in the world works, right? So like, it's like when we start asking, it's so like, we talk about inflation, how everything's getting more fucking expensive and everyone's re reporting record profits. You know what I mean? Like, it's absolutely crazy that like, that all of this, that like we're basically expected to be the, the to level out everyone else's fucking mistakes. But, and this is why it keeps, I know I keep fucking hammering this in. Like, I really believe that like cannabis needs to look outside itself more so that it can see, look at why all of these things are fucking going wrong and then try and figure out how to be better. But instead, we're all just so hyper-focused on whatever bullshit it is and whatever it is, whoever we need to be mad at this week. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Instead of big you, picture. You, you made a really good point there. 
Bro, I've I because I tried I, I have mean, these combos. You are definitely right. Like, you know, I, I can remember back and like it was the talk was better. Even whether it's like grind it better. Now it's it's people pay attention to bag appeal, how big the buds are. Like yeah, big. Yeah. I hate big buds. Me personally. I could care less either way. It just so this is and, not and there's popular. theory behind it because it's like the bigger buds, like you know, I'm talking like the big buds, you know, like oh, whatever, like all oh, this listen, type of shit. This is yeah. not a popular opinion, especially for like the heady boys or whatever. But buds with PGR are easier to deal with. You know what I mean? Like it's fucking like the, the well, that's rocky like, buds. That's like are the like, talk of like the reason purple punch and ice cream cake and these strains get mass produced, lemon cherry gelato runs or whatever you want to say is because producers. That well, no, not I wouldn't say necessarily they're producers. I would say that they're they're prone, meaning it's like growing with training wheels on. Mm -hmm. Like you can fuck oh, it all true, up, true, true. And they're still like, look at it. Oh mm -hmm. my god, look at it in the bag. It looks great. Mm -hmm. true, None true, of them true. smoke, but they're just looking at it, and mm -hmm. it's just like, just look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to do that. Sorry, shout out to <laughs> Bassmaster. Just look at it. That's all you can do. No, yeah, I know. If you don't smoke, that's all you can do. You can just fucking look at it. That's now you can look at it pile up in your facility and look at your accounting and thinking what the fuck is going on it's true look, though man. you can just look at it now but it's oh, true though all you the better money. get in tune though and, and go ask a smoker what the <laughs> fuck they're trying to smoke yeah and, and look at that um but yeah it needs to get back to quality because Do doja says this and it's i want to talk a little bit about that too you guys got an interesting relationship but uh in the time when there's more weed than ever, it's actually harder to find good batches than 100%, ever. 100%. Which is insane because I'm not going to single anyone out or anything like that either. But a lot of the stuff that I felt was good currently is not in my rotation. So I don't and know. That, the stuff that was four or five years ago that I would, I mean, I would go line up for, spend a thousand bucks on easily. No way I would do that now. So I don't know if we talked about this on air or not. But there's a cyclical nature to cannabis. And like, I think this is like, it's with everything the last couple of years, but like brands aren't as king or, or as industry cornerstones as they used to be, right? We even see it happening with like, like the sneaker market and streetwear starting to get disruptive with, new, with newcomers and shit like that. And I think that like a lot of that is like the voice of speaking to right now, right? And like, you know, a lot, it's easy to get comfortable after it seems like you're winning. You know what I mean? Like when you're like one mm -hmm. of the top brands, like, oh, it's just becomes about, okay, I got to increase the scale. I got to fucking be in new states. I got to whatever. And like, I don't want to shit talk anyone specifically, but I think there are a few big brands who started in California were really popping and are now everywhere. And I think that like, the thing that I've heard pretty consistently, and I haven't smoked the weed at all in all the different states or whatever, but it's just that like, it's not, for people who know, it's just not smoking, right? But at the same time, there's a ton of people in all of those states who don't know what smoking is, you know, or like good smoking is. So like for them, they're just excited to have the opportunity, like the lows, you know what I mean? That dies quick, though. It dies quick, but it's also like, again, you got to remember that like- That's what I was just going to say. That shit does not last. Those people do not come back. It, but it's hold all on. off hype. Oh, yeah, it's going to go. We're gonna, they're opening a shop right here. Like, if you we're going to go ahead and check it out. But if you look and at some place- And then they look around like, oh, yeah, this is crazy, crazy. And then, you know, proceed to kind of just fiddle around. And I think just like anybody playing it for the long game, like- you could bank your bucks on them, but it's like, you better just build a community and educate your people and keep them on the same page with you and not get too big so that you got to sacrifice quality because we're moving into quality is everything. And if you don't have quality, you're going to get washed out by capitalism. Like let's but face it, also, it, because all these corporations are going to be able to run at a loss for a decade plus. And none of the small time people are going to be able to do that, even for another year, I would say. But look at like how the limited license states works. And actually, I think this is another Illinois. thing that we talked Illinois, but Florida as well, right? Like brands where the, when the consumers are getting so fucked by the MSOs, your low quality is still so much better than the bullshit that they're delivering that it's enough to float for a while right now. And like, it is. I, I think at the, like the, the markets, as I was saying about the socials and like how the different platforms have very different audiences. 
I didn't know this as much until I started like really traveling around, but like the Miami market versus the New York market versus the Atlanta market, they're all very, they're all very different beasts. Right. And it's hard to speak all of those languages. Right. But to Doja's point, and you started, you mentioned you wanted to bring him up. Um, I think the part, part of, like I said before about like everyone wanting to be, to be seen part of the cheat code to winning right now is just going out and playing the field and like actually being on the scene, letting people know that like you want their business, you care about their business and not just like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a player. So you should know about me. You know what I mean? Like that's, I think the bravado of cannabis is funny because like back in the day, we all needed to hype up all of our shit to be like, this is the best shit available, you know, whatever. So you can get the most price or whatever. But like, it's almost, we've almost become like a caricature of ourselves because like everybody, it still does. It's the best weed ever. This is the best, you know, whatever. This is the same shit as this is the same lemon cherry gelato. It's just called white cherry gelato this time or some bullshit. You know what I mean? Um, I think <sighs> there's a lot of people who aren't a hundred percent. I actually, I wouldn't say a lot of people. The majority of people are not educated enough to know what they're consuming that even the ones that think they're consuming appropriately or like effectively are still being misled by certain let's call it metrics that we've kind of created for ourselves right like so like things like the white ash conversation or like the you know the uh um the length of the um of your ash like the tobacco industry spent a ton of money figuring out what that stuff was and like why certain things are flakier, why certain things uh, stick together, why certain ash burns white. And candidly, what they learned was not the answer that everybody expected. It was not, oh, this shit is just because it burns white or whatever. It's this is, means it's the, it's the best. Like most of these are just our signifiers of, of, or, identifiers of certain qualities of the plant more than anything else. And actually the best, the thing that they said was the best for measuring a quality cigar was how long the ash actually stuck on, right? Like that was a better metric than uh, the color of the ash. But because we're an industry base that doesn't really have a hundred percent of the information, but we want to all seem very informed we're all lean, like lean very hard into like whatever the new cutting edge, like bro science is, right? And like we're seeing that happen right now across the board, and like with from all sorts of shit, right? Like remember in the CBD, uh, in the CBD side, like with the fucking hemp stuff, it was like, what was it? Fucking full spectrum. Then it was, uh, uh, maybe full spectrum was the second one, but, uh, I don't know, whatever. I got fucking sidetracked over. <laughs> No, but it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's different. It's definitely different. And I, I, I just think like, man, we cool. jumped immediately into like with, with the cannabis industry, it just went legal. Right. And we jumped so far quickly into expansion. Yes. And just like bottom dollar, get it low, get it more. Let's triple stack this room. It's like, how about what happened to like, we're better. No, we're producing better weed. No, we have the best weed. That doesn't even come in the combo much anymore. No. It's that oh, no, that's we still produce lost 500 art. pounds of harvest. Here, like, so here's that a, still exists, but it's, it happens on Instagram. It doesn't happen. But it's a lot like, of talk. I mean, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. The, personally, like we have the most expensive build outs of all time. No one ever in, in the, the history of cannabis lead? has spent more on science behind cannabis. And we have the worst weed that we've had in 15 years on average per batch that you buy like eighth. If I bought from eighth from here, eighth from there, because it's like, man, all we've been misled in my opinion with a lot of the new products over the last five or 10 years, because they're all geared towards overproduction, producing more. It's cheaper. all it's again, it's all the investor conversation, right? It's all what is the best pitch for us to go out and raise money mm. and not what is the best long-term business model? Because again, being profitable doesn't even matter at this point if you've got someone who will give you millions of dollars every year. You know, yeah, what I triple mean? stack the room and you know, grow grow it to the ceiling. Why not? And, and when you're go, when you're going to investors and you say, yeah. "Hey, this guy can make fucking fifteen pounds a month out of this room," I'm pulling numbers out of my ass, and we can do forty five. 
that's like a, oh shit, how did they make three times as much weed? Mm-hmm. Like we should be working with those guys. You know what I mean? And like, I've said this a lot, <laughs> but um, part of the looking at other industries and like learning from their best practices is saving us the money on the mistakes, right? Like a lot of people have spent, like I said about the tobacco industry and learning about burning white, right? Like that was millions of dollars they invested into research studies to figure out this information. Like we don't need to go and spend those millions of dollars. We can just see the results and, you know, learn from it. Unfortunately, again, to the ego conversation, so much of the industry just thinks they have it all figured out and they know exactly what's going on that they don't even want to look at their neighbors. They don't want to see who's fucked up before them. People are still making the same mistakes as MedMen made when fucking Rec first went online. You know what I mean? They're still building out facility, like whatever they're saying, we're going to create a chain and then everyone's going to give it to us on terms because they're not going to have anyone else to work with and we're too big for them to say no to. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that would be great if you were actually Walmart, but like, there is no Walmart right now. People aren't saying I'm going to the mega store. They're saying what's close to me. What's got the best deal. What's, you know, whatever. It's still very much a simplified business. And I think that like, you know, the over complexity definitely isn't going to reach the consumer. And overall, if you are planning to be a company that either plans to have an exit or pass on as a legacy brand, you better just shoot for quality. If there's one thing you take away from this conversation is that you better shoot for quality, not shoot for more. And in all these other states like Florida and stuff, I already see the plans. I already see what's going on. Expansion. We got this thousand lights going up and then we're doing another one right next to it. We're building it from the ground up. We're going to do another thousand. Light. And I'm thinking like, dude, like how, like, you know, you don't know if this one's going to work yet. The fucking medical laws are, you know, people can buy two ounces a month. How, like what? Oh, really? That's all. Oh, yeah. Like, so it's already gearing up towards like, oh man, what's going to happen? There's going to be a bunch of old weed on the shelves. Same shit. No competition. Oh, I don't got it. Oh, you, you, no, it just just looks like the demand is there. Well, yeah, because there's no competition. There's no guys out there being like, I got a, I got a a 50 lighter and I got, I'm, I'm stealing the market from them. Now they got to think, should we put another thousand up? Because these guys are eating us with a hundred lights. Well, people better pay attention to the California market for sure. Yeah. And markets like Oklahoma and all these other markets that are like highly, highly saturated. Um, you got and all it's these proven guys, tough to survive. You got mm-hmm. all these guys going and building pitch decks off of like data they found in MJ Biz Daily in fucking 2017 saying, oh, this is the market opportunity. This is how many I feel much bad people, people investing the- in that shit right now. But you know what, well, though? The, the like, market now is not what the market will be in five to 10 years, so, five years, three years, you know. So I don't, I don't think I ever finished this. I've been fucking all over the place today. I no, apologize. it's good. We're having a good combo. <laughs> but I think that, uh, what's it called? The, the part about the pharma thing that I think like might be very interesting. And I think that things that like people need to, isn't such a dirty thing is like, if you build something super successful, right. And like somebody comes to you and offers you money for it. I understand that it's hard to sell off your kid or whatever, but if you can get out, and just make a bunch of money and whatever. Like that's why most people build businesses. Sure, some people want to pass it on to their kids and like, you know, legacy forever, but most people are like building because they, you know, want to make building something that exit. works for them. Right. So we should stop thinking about that as like as if it's a dirty thing, right? Like if you're like like serial entrepreneurs who have made exits, like it's easier for them to get money in the future. It's easier for people to buy in. So like, yes, it's hard to pass off your brand, but once you built something like that, like if burners sold off cookies, people wouldn't necessarily be like, oh my God, cookies is all the rage anymore. They'd be like, what's burner doing now? You know what I mean? Like, I think that's the thing that like a lot of people like lose is like, you are the sauce, right? Like you're the expertise. So like if some major, if fucking big tobacco ends up coming in and taking over the industry or big farmer or whoever, and they come in and they're like, yo, Blackleaf, like we want fucking whatever. Like, listen, respectfully, if I were you, I would take that fucking money oh, for while sure. you got, while you have the opportunity, for sure. obviously don't take paper, but fucking get out, get as much cash as you can and then go build the next one. I want because- Canadian stock. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's They'll do give that. that Please no, give me I, anything on the ECSE. Well, well, that. That well what these the companies and and if they fail to recognize is that, and I don't think they do because I've seen certain moves be made in the hydroponic industry where they keep the operator on and they buy the company and they say, "Hey, uh, five years, we still want you well, to be the an face aquahire. and run it." We, you know, that's an aqua hire, though, but, right? But for you to come into a cultivation as a corporation and say, um, "We're going to buy this and then just take it over, and the next crop will be ours." 
E man, most likely you it's do want back. a one or two year grace period to basically go over SOPs, learn all you need to find someone to fill these shoes. Uh, and that's going to be the tough part. And that's why it, the, the talk right now is like, do does corporate money respect talent or even understand talent or even care about talent? I wouldn't say I wouldn't say they understand it or care about it yet because they don't understand the market hasn't bottomed out. We're still in the race to the bottom and they're still focused on things like this is what a hundred dollar a hundred dollar per pound production is like valuable. Eventually they're gonna realize that like they can't give away those ounces and the value the, the need to produce higher quality is going to come back into that conversation. That is when the value of expertise is going to skyrocket. And all of these guys, this is why, like, again, the thing is to like, it's hard to make money right now. Right. And like, there are plenty of people on it. So I'm not trying to say that like everyone could stay in the game or whatever, but the IP that you have built to this point is, has value in and of itself. They are, you have fans and consumers and people that have smoked your shit until this point. Right. So even if you go out of business right now, there are, there is going to be an opportunity in the future where you can come back and reactivate that base. Right. But again, what they're going to be paying for is your expertise. It is not the, oh, just the clout or, you know, whatever. But when the big business comes in and wants to like, okay, they're just buying brands up or anything like that. That's when the game is, okay, they're going to take that brand and run it to like, it's like when billionaire boys club went to Walmart, right? Like before that, when it was inaccessible, it built up all this hype or like, I would say like boutique over fucking whatever. If you start at a place where like, this is like, viewed as like this hot valuable commodity and it's only accessible by certain people or whatever and then you introduce it on the low end all the people want it because it's got this prestige built up right but if you started at walmart you would never do anything with gucci you know what i mean like they wouldn't respect you because you started on the floor so like the thing about the cannabis industry is like we all have to start on the floor like it's not like there's like some built-in hierarchy here where like even people who've been doing it for generations have some unfair advantage if anything the advantage is built against the people who actually know how to operate and build in favor of the people who are just joining the game you know what i mean but if you know how to play that game and i'm again i'm not saying i'm the guy or like that i have an mba or whatever but if let's say you got a really good lawyer like fucking alien at law right like I'm sure he's dealt with enough contracts that he knows what a good one is and a bad one is. And like, actually the thing that they don't even tell you when you're signing contracts is uh, if you don't have the money to enforce it, it doesn't fucking matter. Like you can get fucked out the ass by fucking uh, what's it called by big corporate, because if you can't pay for the lawyer to go defend whatever it is or fight them for however many months or whatever, it doesn't matter because you'll never get to a judgment, you know? And like, we all like, you don't really know what a bad deal is until you get fucked. You know what I mean? So it's hard to, it's hard to expect anyone to just wake up and be good at this shit. But again, that's what I mean about building connections and partnering with people who actually do know this shit. Because like, if you were expected to like, just read a contract on your own, like think about doing your taxes, bro. Like that shit sucks. And again, more shit they never taught us in school. Like I, the more I think about like, what my actual education was, the more pissed off I get because it's like, it literally was just an indoctrination, like feeding us with bullshit about like Native Americans and shit like that and not like anything that was like, oh, here's actually how to run life. You I know went what to I mean? college for business and I look back and I'm like, when I talk to people like my stepdad and not, not to say that we're even, it's like, where did you learn this? I ask him sometimes, where'd you learn that? Because it's like these, ta he's like, oh, in school. I'm like, the fuck school did I go to? This is crazy. I'll ask him things like, he'll talk about, he'll be like, oh man, in Australia in 1872, they had a revenue. You know, he starts talking about very specific points in time and he, he deducts reasoning behind like, well, this is what happens with, and I'll ask him sometimes, where'd you learn that? And he's like, oh, school. And it just, and it blows my mind. I'm like, man, me and you went to totally different school. Like it's not even in the same ball. I didn't go to a school. You went to a school. It's, I went to something different. It's also very much the setting you're in, right? Because like my college experience is very much like I was throwing shows at that time. I was fucking selling hella weed and fucking other shit. Um, but uh, like I was just, I wasn't paying attention to what was happening in, in the classroom at all. You know what I mean? Just because everything else mattered so much more to me. So like they could have taught me those things <laughs> and I would have just not absorbed it. You know what I mean? And I think that's another thing that like, set and setting matters a lot for everything. You know what I mean? But very specifically, like 
I mean, for me, I've learned the most by doing things. I like, I like to solve problems and like, and detach things and, and, and unpack things. So like figuring out like how things work or why things fail is interesting to me because then it's like it, to your uh, stepdad's point, like it improves my way of thinking for other things. Right. And I know I'm a fucking broken record with this at this point, but like getting, using other people's misfortune to learn and like to grow is like the best thing you can do for not only yourself, but your business, because then you don't have to make these expensive mistakes of like trying to figure shit out. Right. I do think though that like, there's something, there's something special about fucking up yourself. Like by, by failing, you learn the process much better than you ever could in a textbook. So as I say that, and as I say, like, I think, you know, set and setting matters, I definitely think for different people, there's different ways that they could learn. Like some people are, are good at reading a book and absorbing that information. You know what I mean? Like I am with books I want to read. You know what I mean? Like if I'm reading something now, like something that like, you know, I'm interested in, like I can, I'll fly through that shit. You know what I mean? And, and retain it. But I don't think I was ever like that with a textbook. You know, maybe like art history. <laughs> that's probably like the only one. And it was because I was mostly looking at pictures, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's why videos do so well. You know what I'm saying? And that's why with like the Grow Your Own show, it's literally week by week we're going through. So like we, we have a Grow Your Own show we're doing, right? And it's all based on video where like week by week, you'd be like, oh, I'm through week four right now too. And click on week four and it's a video going through. It's just like, video i feel like that's why with youtube it's caught on so much because i'm like how do i fix my sync press play and i'm like literally like okay like this you know it, it, it i was the guy who when i would read something i'd have to read it three times over and then yep. be like okay got it it's easier to absorb like listen this is a perfect example you ever try and fucking read about dancing <laughs> no, it's the craziest shit ever and honestly you know the reason why I, this is in my head is because when i was in elementary school they made a square dance i don't know why but they gave us a pamphlet and it was like this is how you fucking do the square dance thing right it was like a gym thing for one you know one month and they showed us on the thing like your foot does this and like whatever and it was fucking completely impossible to like understand when you're looking at dance moves but it's super fucking easy if you just watch the guy swing his fucking leg around and be like okay i just gotta do that and that you know what i mean so like Again, there's all these different ways that like people can absorb information. Actually, another this is very stupid, but um, I say I'm not good at like reading things or whatever. But for some reason, I'm not good at remembering somebody's name until I see it written down. Like if I see them on Facebook, if I see them on Instagram or something like that, like that's when the name really imprints in my memory. Whereas if they just tell it to me for some reason, like I like even if I say it in my head a few times, like it doesn't retain the same way, you know visual learner over audible learner yeah yeah it's yeah very but it's, interesting it, like it, dep that. it depends on the specific thing though mm -hmm. you know what i mean because like again like if i was like if i was learning how to do fucking you know build a show or something like that if i just read it from a book like it would not or grow a plant exactly yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. like that's also again the trial and error thing is like the more you fuck it up the better you get at actually doing it because you learn how to fix things right whereas i feel like this is also the nature of like the immediate satisfaction of today. Like if you fuck up, you just don't really do things again. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's like, that's something that we're like losing just as society is like people think if they're not like inherently good at something that like, they're just not meant to be good at something. And uh, not that like people spend their whole life getting really fucking great at something, you know? I have a question. If there was one article someone needed to research that is like one of the ones you're most proud of, something that they're like, man, I need to, I want to look this guy's name up and say, what article would it be? Something you've written. <sighs> That's tough. Um, I think that every article I write, I think is a little bit better than the last one because I'm like a little bit more informed or whatever. I think that probably the most... The piece that's definitely the hardest for people to get through that I think is the most valuable for people is uh, the shit talking piece, just because that's really, it was written for me as much as it was for the audience and like my kind of journey into like understanding what I'm projecting when I, you know, say certain things. Um, and like, again, like I think that like the immediate satisfaction of fucking Instagram and like we want to some degree, uh, maybe it's just me, but like some degree, like we want drama sometimes, you know what I mean? It like, it spices things up. Like, like when the, when a car is crashing, like we can't help, but like get locked in. Right. And so I think that, um, that one, 
again, it's hard to read, but I think it like it says the best thing. Um, the one that maybe is the best brand story so far, maybe Doja's. I really, I'm really proud of that one. Um, with the Wizard Tree story is pretty good. That one took me like a year to do. So um, I am that one was a good one. Um, and then I have two articles in the most recent art issue, which I think are. I did something a little bit different. And it's not tremendously different, but I, <laughs> interviews are hard, man. Like it's like it's a lot to, tr especially when you're writing them, right? Like it, it, this is hard enough, just like talking and trying to get like you know the gems out of people, especially like when you got someone like me who just fucking grambles and gets distracted <laughs> with fifteen things. But like trying to turn it into a like a. a coherent story and like making you know helping people get something out of it lately what i've been doing is kind of setting the stage in the first you know first few paragraphs and then by like the second half of the story kind of letting the uh the subject take it over and not necessarily in a qa format where it's like oh this is in bold this is my question this is how they responded it but more I try and have a complete conversation while I'm doing it. And then it kind of like wiggle out, wiggle it around so that it like kind of tells the story in the proper order, as opposed to like the side rants and all the shit we get, we get struck into. But these, the most recent ones, the guys who I was talking to, one guy is from Austria. He's this artist called Nichos, who's fucking incredible. Um, and then the other one's this graffiti artist, Sess, who's another guy who I grew up fucking idolizing who um, both of them are very, not just artistic in their daily life, but in the way they say things and the, like the way that they communicate, right? And so I was trying to, uh, I didn't want to lose that color in like in the conversations. And I think like Sess was the first one I did before I actually wrote the Nichos piece, but I had so many quotes that like there were still left to go after I realized like I was at like 2,500 words that I was like, I literally cannot say anything else besides just stack his quotes in the right order. Right. So like in the, one of them, I put a little right uh, editors or writer's note. That's basically like, um, I'm running out of space and there's so much, there's so many gems here that I don't want to lose. So I'm just going to let Seth take it from here. Right. And like the rest of the shit is just like him kind of talking about like how he's kept trying to push himself and get more creative. And like the way he says things like there's a line that I know I'm going to butcher if I repeat it, but he says something along the lines of like, I was hanging out in like the worst neighborhoods, like hanging on the side of buildings that I didn't know who the, what, whose building it was or who the fuck owned it or anything like that. Um, up to no good. You know what I mean? He's like, and now you couldn't pay me enough to like Uber through that neighborhood in a fucking bulletproof SUV. You know what I mean? Like just fucking real New York shit. Right. Um, and so like for me, like I think I'm getting better at actually telling stories in the way that they're meant to be told. Whereas in the past I was kind of more trying to force a storyline into a situation. Right. So again, I really do believe, and actually the story that I think is the best that I've ever done, which I'm still probably three, four months out on is uh, the story of Alien Labs. Um, I want, I want, I love it. I love Ted. I love Alien Labs of the story. It's one of the first brands that like I really saw and identified with when I got to California. Um, and there's a lot of nuance there that um, I think is too important to not mention, but also uh, do it in a way that is political and makes everyone feel good and doesn't necessarily feel like you're throwing shots. You know what I mean? Um, and like, listen, obviously he's been super open about like his story and stuff like that. Uh, but he also has a real, like with Ted, I get the conversation is better when I'm with him. Like there's mannerisms and things that I pick up on when he like explains things. And like, I, like I could, when I could see how he, how proud he is when he talks about certain things that like, I never really noticed in other interviews until I started this one, because it was one that I like really cared about. Whereas like a lot of the other ones have been like stories that like, I know needed to be told, you know what I mean? And so like Ryan's was actually probably one of the most rushed stories there. Doja is probably one of the most rushed stories I did because that was like one of the first guys that I was like, all right, this guy is breaking. I've never kind of like just put someone out that like isn't really getting a lot of attention before. You know what I mean? Like most of the stories had been about like the brands that like were kind of 
figure or, or cornerstones, I would say. And so like, they were kind of like, let's say softballs, right? Like they all knew like enough, had done enough interviews and stuff like that. Ryan was the first one that was like, okay, I could really help this guy tell his story. Um, and then it became more of like seeing how that worked and how people responded to it and how like, how, like, again, like how far the story would resonate past just like, Hey, we're, you know, we're telling something cool. We're actually like hitting people, um, made me want to go deeper with it and just see like how far I could push that. Like, not just, Hey, we're telling stories, but Hey, we're actually like, again, inspiring, like really like, like the thing that was is so interesting to me about Ryan is like, when I used to sell weed, like what he does is fundamentally what I think every weed dealer does, right. Is like try and find the best weed he can and sell it to his people. Right. And then like, eventually he realized that like, once he starts putting his name on it and like, whatever, there's a clout that comes with it. And that like, he can work, make better deals with people if he put their name on it too and shit like that. And then like, and there's we all a trust grow together. Factor. Exactly. Yeah. But it, that's like, really what he's doing is curating. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like yeah. he's literally saying, this is the weed that I think is the best. Let me slap my sticker on it and get it out there. And that like for a lot of people in the game, like if they just kept pushing and kept going and going, going like that's the end point. And I don't want to call it the end point because he's not done yet. You know what I mean? But like, that's where you end up. And I think that like, just for people to hear that, like, you don't need to be, and like I said, again, as someone who's not a cultivator, right. Mm -hmm. But like, you don't necessarily mm -hmm. need to be in the farm to like really make an impact with this plant. You know what I mean? And again, like obviously good curation is going to help determine how what the trajectory is and if you don't care the, the less you the less you care the less hypey your shit's really ever going to get because like if you just have the same shit as everyone else that's you're not going to build in allure but also like by getting out there and putting your name on it and putting your stamp on it and showing and like to some degree having the audacity to say like i am a curator of dope shit and this is what you should check out like people want that the same thing i was saying before about like they want to feel like they want their opinions reflected back at them like they want champions in a lot of different you know realms right like whether it be like what how they dress or how what music they listen to or whatever and like i think that like it for okay so i said started to say this before but like i never really saw myself especially as a kid as like the the front man of anything i was always the behind the scenes guy i was always the like I don't need the spotlight. I'll just collect a check and, you know, work the lights or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, the last couple of years though, with high times, because I don't have very many employees and like, you know, like there's only so many people at the brand who like actually live this shit. Um, I kind of got pushed into it. Right. And I, every day, every time I do something like this, every time I'm on camera, every time I see a picture of myself, whatever, I'm like, fuck, I look like a schmuck. You know what I mean? So like, I know how much that takes to get out there and really be that person and, and go and like to all these cities where people don't know you and be like, yeah, I'm the shit. Check it out. You know what I mean? Like that's, there's gall to that, you know? And like, as much as everyone thinks like they are the best or they, whatever, not everyone's doing that. You know what I mean? So like, to, again, like, I think that some people just need to hear if you step another foot forward every day, eventually you'll get much further than where you are now. And I don't think we hear that enough. So like Ryan's story was like a great, like, this is whatever. I think the same reason why Ted's story matters so much to me is because like, this is like a true, like American dream story. You know what I mean? Like this guy built an empire out of, you know, the fucking dirt and that deserves to be celebrated in a way that's not careless of the story. And so the, the thing about, again, like being pushed in this situation is like, I got tons of writers. You know what I mean? I got tons of fucking freelancers and shit like that, but I can't pay them to focus on all this nuance. You know what I mean? So for me, I could take a year, two years to write a story that I think will matter when I drop it, as opposed to most of these kids who like, like, cause I'm also not paid to write. 
I've never been like, I don't get a dollar extra for any of the shit I put out. That's more just like me trying, like, again, the cop list was because I didn't want people to think that anything I posted on Instagram was like a good buy. Um, and like, you know, a lot of these stories are because like, I don't, I know that like a lot of my freelancers, especially kids who live in different States and stuff like that, don't have the hands-on experience with these brands to like see all the nuance. And also like, again, to the bravado of the industry, it, you might not see it as much on like your level, like when you're like in, from the operator to operator, but like, you'd be amazed at the shit that people claim when they talk to us. Like, oh, I'm the first person to do this and like shit like that. And a lot of journalists, like we take it seriously at high times because, you know, whatever. But a lot of journalists think like, oh my God, guy says he's like, like you were saying about fucking dude claims New York. Like that's like great for clicks, right? <laughs> like people don't realize that saying things like that are like, you know, are polarizing to some mm -hmm. people, you know? And listen, there's a million people who run a ton of waves off of that shit. Look at Trump. Like Trump literally got the White House by being as ridiculous as he could every day just to stay front page. And enough of us had seen him on fucking the, you're fired was the apprentice and like believed he was a fucking billionaire that like, we were like, all right, fuck it. We let's, let's give this guy a fucking shot, you know? And obviously, you know, there was all sorts of good things and bad things that happened in leading up to that, that too. We were very disillusioned. So I think like at this point we're like, can anybody help us? Yeah. yeah you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. Somebody out there that can help us. I have a question though about New York since you're from New York. What do you think about the nostalgia of sour diesel and piff and it coming back into the New York market or trying to, do you think it's, what do you think? So about that? I love diesel. I grew up on diesel. Um, I definitely think that, uh, a lot of the people that are saying they're growing sour diesel right now are, they don't know what sour diesel was. It's the, the first place. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's the diesel. It's the diesel. Um, the, the hay is sour. The haze the and the Death piff Star. conversations, <laughs> like, I was less like by the time, like I was really conscious about where my shit was coming from. I already knew that Cali was killing it. So it was really like a, what can, what can we get from California? You know what I mean? Which was more like that, that was like really the New York shit. And there's also like New York doesn't really love to claim this, but there were tons of fucking indoor grows where like behind fucking laundromats and fucking Chinese food restaurants and shit like that, that put plenty of fucking cush work into this into the that's city. what i love you know wherever I mean? we touch down we're always like what's up with some local yeah like yeah, in yeah. in spain and i mean wherever we go we're like what's up with some local like because i want i mean hopefully it came from work. yeah I, I it came it. from that building and got put right in my hand that's yeah, yeah, yeah so that's honestly that's the part of the game for me too right is like i'm a flavor chaser i want to see and also like i really what what's frustrating about being in california is like it really is and this uh, it's gonna sound so egotistical but we really are like fortunately on the bleeding edge of this shit right so like a lot of the things that are happening first are happening here first right so that does make us all jaded and get over shit really quickly right we're ready to move on to the next thing fucking before this one's even really fully out but most of the market doesn't really work like that right so like we're kind of like constantly trying to push the new shit kind of trying to push whatever but like other markets i think we said i don't know if he said this on air but like like the way the trap doesn't really love fruity strains or floral strains right like that's like pretty common knowledge out here but it's not necessarily like that on the east coast or like on fucking in the southeast right like those guys are more forgiving of like to your point like the hazy and like you know like uh fucking sour type stuff because that's what they're used to from back in the day whereas for me, it's less of a question of what the genetics is and more like, can I taste it? Because mm. that's, I think, something that was like, not we really got back in New York. Like it was more like sour was the first thing that like we could taste. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that was True like- blunt. A, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that was like, that was why everyone chased it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like the white, uh, what they call it with fucking heroin, the white rabbit, we're fucking chasing the- uh, Yeah, the, yeah. Whatever, they're chasing the dragon, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. We, <laughs> we have that like, that fucking beautified fucking uh, picture in our head that is probably better in our memory than it actually ever was in real life. But like, because that's what we see is like the quality of greatness, everyone's trying to trace it. Um, I actually have this strain right now, uh, Red Congolese, which was like a fucking, an OG back in the day. And I fucking love it because it actually really makes me that wiry fucking stoned. You know what I mean? Like, I can't find that with anyone who's fucking, even like orangey terps things like aren't doing that for me anymore. And I don't know what it is. Like, I do think that there's some degree, it might be the indoor process, it might be whatever, but like weed doesn't seem to, and 
I also smoke a fuck ton of it now. You know what I mean? So I'm not trying to seem like, you know, everything is equal to what it was, but it did seem like weed was more impactful like 10 years ago. You there know what I mean? There was more care and it costs more to produce. Well, but so also the high you're like putting lasted. More. That's that's more like, I mean because like Because more quality based. inputs. It'd be, it's the same with food in your system. It's the same with anything. It's like intellectual food too. Certain foods, you know, yeah, you think better. You think more clear. It's the same. You could think it's parallel to drugs, right? You take a certain drug, you get a certain feeling. So it's the same thing. When we put certain things in our plants, we get certain reactions. When we take things away, we get the same reaction, right? And it's the same thing when we say, well, let's put up these lights and we can produce more. But we didn't think about, is the weed better or are we over, you know, because there, there becomes a, a, a cash crop effect of let's push this thing to its limit to get as much as we can out of it without the th second thought of, is it as good as it was? That's why I brought up the shit about PGRs, because like it's like you improve one section mm -hmm. of the plant and like you totally discount what else it's doing to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like this uh, same thing about the THC conversation is like now breeders are breeding or are choosing the phenos that produce the most THC because that's what the market responds to, even though that might not be the most interesting expression. You know, mm -hmm. and like we can't blame them for that because that's the metric that they, that the market's working off of right now. But also, like that's so we crazy, can't expect though. them to shoot themselves in the foot. That's so crazy though, because when I show you a bag of weed, what's the first thing you do? Either you look at it or you smell it first. Most likely, you look at it and you're like, oh yeah. But the real test is the smell. So why would we care how potent it is? That's not even in the con. When I show you weed, you're never like, ooh, it looks strong. Yep. It, it, you know, it, it's usually, damn, that smells but good. What's and the then metric, you entice. But what's the metric for like, you can smell the shit across the room. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like what, what can they test for on a regular scale and say like, it's not a volume. You can't. It's not a volume bar. You know what I you mean? You can't like, because I've had tasteless shit and it says like 4% terpenes. And I'm like, this has zero smell. It's a, you know, a, a, you know, not to dig on anything, but it's like, let's just say like a Cushman's. And the Cushman's has very little smell at all, or it's a cookies and cream, but yep. it says like 3.8% terps. And it's like, where? What terps are those? And I, you, it's like, you got to smoke. It's like, oh, the nuances. And it's like, yeah, I get that. But 3.4, I will you, say forbidden fruit, 3.4. It's like, I will say I'm right. Currently sus of all lab results that I see. Yeah. So like, it's, oh, it's, it's one of those things of like, everyone is get playing the game one way or the other. So like, who is really nobody? Uh, nobody there's i have i got in a ring of cultivators the other day and i'm listening to conversations happen and one of them's like hey man he's telling the other guy just so you know like when you get time when it's time just know that like so this is what's happening in the market guys are taking nugs and rolling it in keef and then having that tested yep. and then you'll always test over 30 percent. you'll test 30 and then the the labs are saying if we give you a real test result let's say we bring in your your really fire strain and it tests at 18%, you're you'll never gonna, come back yep. here. So we lose the business. And it's like, well, shit. So we were talking about how do you get around this? And they're so like, it has the to be- cheater? Yeah. And it's like, well, then other guys are taking buds and freeze drying them, right? And over drying them so that the weight of THC percentage is higher. There's all these tricks and people are going in saying, sell me the best trick. I'll take the best trick. But it's the same, again, it's the same VC mentality, right? They're not thinking about providing value. They're not mm. thinking about customer service. They're thinking about margins. This whole game is like, how do we maximize whatever? They're, the education of THC percentage is not like, they're, they know what they're doing. They, think they're, they created a system where youth, where consumers who don't know think that this is a quality metric so that they can sell something that's 41% THC for fucking $80 because this is super potent. And like now, the, the, down, the long side downside of it is now you have states where they're doing certain like THC caps and like, oh, if you test over this, whatever. So you're going to charge me for testing over for something that probably isn't even over, but you're, I mean, this is the tax. They try, it's like when they give rich, uh, rich people fucking parking tickets. Like that's just more expensive parking for them. You know what I mean? Like if the ticket's not going to stop them from doing it again, you just charge them a hundred bucks to park in front of the building. You know what I mean? Like that's what's happening to these guys. Like, okay, now you're just, I'm going to pay the tax to seem like I got better weed. And now fucking the consumer is going to think this is better. Jeez, man, it's crazy. How do you navigate this market? Pack I don't odds? think much of it will translate. I feel like the conversation's been all over the board today. 
It's good. We're jumping yeah. into three hours. Oh, yeah. Damn, are <laughs> we? Wait, really? Yeah. Wow. We're going to bring this baby full oh, circle. Shit. We're going to bring <laughs> it full bad. circle for the One gang. Last, how do you navigate the market, though, It's Packer? a long winning combo. Yeah, Just have is. to save it for part two of the episode, for yeah. real. If you didn't know, we do behind the scenes after this and all yeah, that shit gonna goes on. Yeah, we're going to save it for behind the scenes. Get on the Patreon if you're not. Mm-hmm. Really, this is in three I'm hours? A, I'm a smoke I'm so ping stoned. Pong. Make sure you tune in. I'm so stoned. I've been fucking all over the place. I apologize no. if I didn't get anything Bro, out of this. Dude, good <laughs> you know what it is? I got to take a piss and uh, <laughs> no, I'm getting no, no. signal by my man over here. He needs another coffee. No, do your thing. Good combo, man. Shout out to any last things you want to poke um, at for the future. I mean, definitely check us out on how high times. Um, we work very hard to, uh, you know, produce something that we can all be proud of. Um, we're still do the magazine every month. Uh, we got hightimes.com. Uh, I'm on social at, at John Capetta, J O N C A P P E T T A. Um, and yeah, uh, co- check out the cop list. Check out actually the weirdos. That's that to me is my baby. And that's what I think is probably the, where do we find weirdos at? Hightimes.com slash weirdos. Nice and Boom. easy. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we've, we've been telling some really good stories, but yeah. also we, again, want everything to be representative. Mm-hmm. So if you want to see a story, if you want to write a story, um, please let us know. So we're always, uh, always looking for more voices. Are we going to see cups in the future come back to California? So, oh, I wouldn't even talk about, fuck, we didn't have to talk about anything important. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's kind of whatever. We could go five hours easy. Uh, the cups... When COVID happened, we pivoted the model into the retail thing. So that we didn't realize at the time turned into a cash cow for us. So that's a model that's not going away. But cups will definitely be coming back as in the traditional model as well. Um, We actually just acquired a consumption lounge in uh, West Hollywood. So I am trying to get them to let me do a like let's call it underground uh, cup or like a, like a locals cup um, at the end of this year. Um, but we'll be probably opening that up for like holiday parties and stuff like that. So oh. now that we uh, now that they have something like a real footprint for us, um, we're going to start doing a lot of cool shit. So part two, we'll do a live recording in the high times. Oh uh, yeah. I'd love to. I can't part wait. Two, I love that day. John Capetta, you'll be able to come see it, come enjoy it. Shout out to High Time. Shout out to you, John. January, man, we have a big first smoke January of the day. January 21st, party. first smoke of the day subscriber party. You got to be a subscriber to come. It's going to be in LA. We're picking the venues out. It's going to be dope. So I can't just show there. up. You got to be a Patreon member. You got to be a subscriber. Even yeah. if you, pay, you subscribe that day and you can come to the if, party, it's going to be can, wild. You can, but you got to let Biggs the, kick you in the nuts if you do that. Oh, man, I got a big leg still. <laughs> nah, that's you a good come yeah. after you. That's a good Free ticket me- mechanism. Oh, it's going to be you fun. You know what yeah. I mean? Just like, oh, you okay, you want to come back, to the show? But Biggs is going to get one good swing. Maybe you do Maybe you do a special tier for that month where like the price goes from like $15 to $25 because like you guys didn't, you weren't, this is for January only. It's a double uh, extra fee because you uh, came in late. We're dialing the tiers. We're going to introduce more tiers, mm-hmm. a more fuck affordable yeah. tier, a higher level tier, mm-hmm. um, and the Grow Your Own show is on the way, man. Yeah. So, fuck a lot yeah. of stuff coming January 1st. I mean, crazy changes, crazy openings. If you want your name at the end of the show, that's going to probably be might, there. We might. You might be able to be a producer and get in the credits out. and yeah. shit. Get on the Patreon. Fuck yeah. John, thank you. Yeah, thank bro. you Shout guys. out to High Times. And For go real, check out Weirdos if you guys haven't checked it out. Go check out my man's cop list as well. Mm-hmm. I appreciate you. And for real, like, congratulations on everything. I love what you guys are doing. And I'm excited to see where you go. Appreciate you, bro. Excited for the future. 73. Hey, yeah. episode 73. Appreciate you guys. We're out. Yo, welcome to the Diamond Mine. The DiamondMine.LA, California source for boutique genetics. Powered by yours truly, Blackleaf. And you know what that means? That means I'm bringing my best genetics into this. I'm bringing stuff I've been hiding, harboring away, stuff I haven't wanted to let out. We're bringing all that into the diamondmine.la and we're gonna offer that to California. Go on our website, hit the newsletter, and see if you could rock with us. Get on board with some of our genetics and change your garden. The diamondmine.la, powered by Blackleaf.